Religious Metaphysics, a lecture by Jonathan Barlow Gee, Part 1, In Legends, Part 1, The West, Part 1A, Kabbalah. Above even the purely geometric forms of Abba, the Father, and Ima, the Mother, principle who created the cosmic demiurge who in turn created our cosmos is this diagram showing the peeled back scalp removed portion of skull and exposed brain tissue of the head of god given from a 16th or 17th century manuscript on the Tikuni zohar in his commentary on the complete Zohar of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai from 2nd century Israel, 20th century Kabbalah scholar Rav Yehuda Ashlag explains the manner of the creation as occurring due to expansion and contraction, the effect of God breathing in and breathing out, which is called in Hebrew, Tsimtsum. According to the cosmology described in the Bereshit Beth volume of the 23 book long complete edition of the Zohar, supposedly copied down into print first by Moses de Leon in 13th century Spain from the oral traditions begun by Rabbi Shimei and Bar Yochai, there were four Tsimtsums that occurred to divide apart the upper layers of each of the four elemental worlds of Hakabalah. As the first ray of thought emanated within the mind of God in a line across these Tsimtsum ripples at right angles, it caused smaller ripples or expansions outward in all directions where it intercepted the first four tsimtsums, and these were called the ten sephirot points. The rays of thoughts emitted in a single direction were called the twenty-two paths, and the sephirot nodes for the rippling outward from their intersections are called the ten emanations. The thirty-two mystical paths of wisdom are discussed in great detail in Sefer Yetzirah, particularly in the modern translation by Arya Kaplan. The metaphor of a Kabbalistic Tree of Life diagram originates when each of the ten Sephirot emanations reflecting ripples from the first ray of thought inside the mind of God emit pathways or rays of thought of their own. Here we see, expressed as a Kabbalistic metaphor of the Tree of Life diagram, the figurative hand of God that holds within it the chisel of pure light that broke the vessels of the lesser light. This constellation of figurative imagery depicting these Kabbalistic concepts is merely the language of ancient and elder peoples describing the same states and levels of awareness of the cosmos as described in mathematical terms by modern science, as I will explain at the end of this lecture. The natures of the greater light and the lesser light are further discussed in Sefer Bahir from the first century AD. At this stage, the tree of life chisel of pure light held in the hand of God, touched the surface on the origin point of God's expanding consciousness, and this action resulted in the shattering of the shells or vessels, called the cliffoth in Hebrew and the kelepod in Greek. Here we see the first appearance of Adam Cadman as the skeletal interior shape underlying the tree of life chisel held in the hand of God, in the form of the four Hebrew letters of the Tetragrammaton name of God, 
arranged in order from above to below. At the intersections of the seven lower sephirot, where the chisel of pure light broke the vessels of the lesser light, there expanded dimensions from nothingness in the following manner, as described in great detail in Sefer Yetzirah. From the centroid point of each of the seven lower sephirot expanded six directions in three dimensions. The four watchtowers attended four walls at the horizon line along the four cardinal directions, thus beginning to form the skeletal outline of the cube of space. The complete combination of the traits of the six directions in three dimensions with the four watchtower walls surrounding the cube's centroid point symbolizes the continuum of space, the three dimensions, with time, as the expanding cube formed by the four cardinal directional walls along the horizon of expansion. Thus, the cube of space-time formed in each of the seven lower Sephiroth realms where the pure light of the chisel of God broke the vessels of the lesser light, allowing the shards or shells of these vessels to crumble down and solidify surrounding these seven fallen Sephiroth. The existence of this arrangement has been known to scholars of Kabbalah for at least 3,000 years. However, even before it began being chronicled into the Kabbalistic cosmology described in most detail in the Bereshit Beth volume of Sefer Zohar, the study of the perfect Ashlar cube of space-time was being studied extensively by the master builders of Old Kingdom Egypt. The first form of this space-time symbolic cubical space experimented with by the ancient Egyptians involved aligning the point of view of an onlooker inside any of the complex Egyptian tombs with the north-south axis facing south and their arms along the east-west axis, left arm west and right arm east, etc., this form of cubical orientation for the arrangement and onlooker's point of view within an, any Egyptian tomb was applied to the positioning of the massive sarcophagus that held within it the mummy of the pharaoh. However, in the adjacent room of the tomb to the crypt housing the sarcophagus of the mummified pharaoh, which housed the canoptic jars containing the pharaoh's dehydrated organs, as well as in the outer chamber of the tomb, containing the doorways to the crypt and to the room housing the canoptic jars. Both of these rooms, furniture and decorations, are arranged according to a different variation of the same cubic model showing the position for an onlooker to stand to assume the correct point of view for observing the accoutrements and art of the tomb. Here we see that, in the outer chamber and the adjacent room for the canoptic jars, as opposed to the layout and arrangement of characteristic traits in the room with the large sarcophagus, the onlooker is encouraged to stand facing west, with their arms extended with the right toward the south and left toward the north. This is where originated the concept of the perfect cubit-hewn ashlar stone symbolizing the perfection into pure spirit of the greater light from a mental condition associative with an imperfect soul and the lesser light symbolized by the rough-hewn or unworked ashlar stone. Where these two cubes begin to relate to form a single cube seen as separate from itself only over time, the chisel tip of Hakabala touches the centroid thought at the core of God's mind, and Hakabala becomes anthropomorphized as Adam Cadman. Part 1b Adam Cadman
Cadman. We have now followed Kabbalistical reasoning as it attempted to plot the formation of the cosmos and its forces from a point beyond even the exterior of the head of God in which our cosmos is only a dream. As we zoom in toward the depiction of the head of God, we enter the realm of the glowing gloom, the bright darkness, the false light, etc., wherein our cosmic creation began being brought into being. As God's singular ray of thought emanated downward toward the core of his consciousness, outward rippling flow, piercing downward to discover the source of its perturbations from an absolutely calm, still, zero energy field, it shattered these original vessels in four places, forming the division of the cosmos into the four elemental forces or four hakabalistic worlds. Each of these worlds formed into its own cosmos. In Hakabalistic world of Isaiah, the lowest and central most realm, there were ten ripples emanating from the utmost central core world, which was called Malkuth, meaning the kingdom. The three supernal sephirot of these ten did not expand and remain as ethereal levels invisible within our own physical cosmos, but present in the form of the effect of our consciousness resulting from them as cause. The lower seven sephirot of the ripples in Isaiah expanded into the six cardinal directions and the inner direction of the passage of time. These form the dimensions of the cosmos surrounding Malkuth, the kingdom. The four dimensions, the three doubled into six cardinal directions, plus the fourth direction of the forward motion of time, and the four elemental forces, fusion or earth, electromagnetism or air, fission or fire, and gravity or water, are reflections in the lower realm of Isaiah the cosmos of Malkuth, of Hakabalistic concept of the four worlds, Isaiah, Bariah, Yetzirah, and Atzaluth. The four-letter tetragrammaton name of God symbolizes all these thought models and is shown here anthropomorphically depicting a man's anatomy as having two legs, final he, two arms, he, and a head, Yod, around a single torso, Vav. This anthropomorphism of the Tetragrammaton is also the first formation of God inside the cosmos around Malkuth in the form of Adam Kadmon, meaning the cosmic man. In his depiction of Gnostic concepts studied in Takuni Zohar, Eliphas Levy, 19th century French Kabbalist, shows us the first stage of coming into being of Adam Kadman, wherein God, as the waters above, perceives himself as darkness on the face of the deep, in the cosmos as the waters below. His image appears distorted from its own point of view inside the mirror below God because of the disruption from stillness by God's breath moving like the wind on the air above the deep, causing the first ripples to begin emanating from Malkuth, the kingdom, deep within the mind of God. Thus the demiurge, devil, Satan, or anti-God first appears as the reflection of God in the disquieted waters of the lesser light in the cosmos below. Next, as shown in this drawing also by Levy, God figuratively lowers himself into the cosmos of Isaiah surrounding Malkuth to become Adam Kadman 
were the cosmic template upon which the bodily image and likeness of man were based. God descends into the cosmos of Isaiah, it is written, in search of Shekinah, his female counterpart, called variously the Presence, the Bride of God, and Sophia, meaning feminine wisdom as the first emanation following forth from the crown of the Godhead. As God descends, the cosmos of Isaiah expands due to the displacement of fluid energy by the gravity of his mass. Thus, the God manifest within the cosmos of Isaiah appears from the point of view below him as the devil. In this final depiction by Levi, we see that by the time God, as Adam Cadman, has lowered himself down to the level of Malkuth, the kingdom at the center deep within the entirety of his mind, to where he can walk among man, he assumes the form of both Christ and Antichrist combined. Thus the crown of awareness is made of the thorns of other people's minds inside a psychic network called Christ Consciousness, combining into any one person's mind the entire potential capacity for intellect of all mankind. Hence, Christ's title as Son of Man, Son of God, as well as his being the mind of God, but also God's only incarnate Son. In this 17th century printing by Christian Kabbalist Athenaeus Kircher, we see the triune halo representing God in the form of the Christian Trinity concept atop the wheels of concepts emanating outward from a core symbolizing the cosmos of the Kabbalistic world of Isaiah. Here we see Adam Cadman, the cosmic template of man's physical body and the mind of God that can possess any living person, depicted as a childlike Christ, whose limbs reach across the cosmos of Isaiah and who is yet bounded within the outer three realms of the other Kabbalistic worlds. Here we see the outer edge of the cosmos of Isaiah, to which the reach of the childlike Adam Cadman extends, is marked by the wheel of the zodiac, and that the microcosmos within the young Christ's reach is comprised of the seven planetary orbits, symbolizing the six cardinal directions plus the forward motion of time. Below these are three worlds surrounding Malkuth, the kingdom, which signify the three essential elements of alchemy, salt, sulfur, and mercury, signifying alike frozen, fluid, or vapid, the conditional states of matter as symbolic of the three spatial dimensions. Malkuth, at the center of which are Adam Cadman's genitals, is shown in black. Beneath the feet of Adam Cadman, in the three upper worlds of a Kabbalistic four worlds, are three groups of three aspects. These signify the seven heavens and seven archangels of Bariah, the twelve permutations of the three tetragrammatons, names of God, of Yetzirah, and the three layers of the greater light, Ayin, Ayin Sof, and Ayin Sof Or, of Atsaluth, the uppermost world. In this depiction, we see the zodiac circle as surrounding Adam Cadman, as alike an Ouroboros or Aura, signifying the realm beyond God, when God is lowered into a form of body in the cosmos of Isaiah. The origin of attributing the twelve signs of the zodiac to Shekinah, the presence or bride of God, 
begins with the Chinese application of the meridians, which we will discuss in the section on the East, to the twelve signs of the zodiac by astrologers following Marco Polo's explorations of the Orient. Applying the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac to the twelve meridians of Chinese Taoism originated in the Orient, but was not brought back into Europe until the early era of the Dark Ages, during the First Crusade. The practice of astrology, like also mathematic, geomancy, alchemy, etc., was made illegal across most of Europe during the Dark Ages, and this manuscript, comparing the wheel of the zodiac around the edge of the page to the organs inside an autopsied cadaver, represents the height of scientific blasphemy committed in the face of the Church of Christ by radical rationalist Kabbalists. However, this knowledge proved to not be isolated to those in contiguous Eurasia, as we see in this diagram from the Mixtec Cherokee regions of southern North America and northern Mesoamerica, the association of human bodily parts and organs to aspects of the calendar was not confined to only one continent. The animal head symbols surrounding the naked body in this depiction symbolize the 18 months of the lunar calendar that date back to that originally developed by the southern Mesoamerican Maya. So we see now that Adam Cadman, symbolizing the cosmic template of man in the form of a Kabbalistic body of God as a form of cosmic atlas, holding, instead of only our own world on his back, the balance of the elemental forces in the cosmos of Isaiah. Just as below, at the level of the veil of the temple, are the seven Olympic gods, called now by their Roman names, identified with the seven visible planets, so above, at the level of the veil of the abyss, are the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac. Just as Adam Cadman, the body of God as a Kabbalah, represents the Abba, or Father Principle of Cosmic Generation. So does Shekinah, or the Bride of God, represent Ima, the equal Mother Principle counterpart. So we see now the Shekinah, symbolizing the astrological influence on man by the Zodiac, and the motive Olympic planets, as an inner border of the cosmos of Bariah, holding within herself not the seven planets alone, but also in her upright anatomy, the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac, expressed from Aries above her head through Pisces beneath her feet. Her anatomy as a series of astrological signs in the Babylonian zodiac thus identifies the zodiacal Shekinah, or Bride of God, with the Egyptian concept of Nuit, the female emptiness of deep space. Thus, to see again the simple circle of the astrological zodiac signs, we are looking at the anatomy of the upright Shekinah, as well as within her vesica symbol for the female womb as a symbol in turn for the vacuum of the void. Here we see how the seven planets are assigned as rulers, dignitaries, or Olympic gods over the twelve Babylonian zodiac signs. The upper five regular planets are oriented as horizontal bars across the face of the flat twelve sign zodiac circle, and the final two classical Olympic planetary gods of antiquity, the sun and moon, rule over the final two signs of the zodiac. Thus, each planet rules over a pair of zodiac signs, but the sun and moon only rule over one each. Hence, the seven Olympic dignitaries of the seven visible planets rule within the zodiac circle in a Kabbalistic study of astrology. 
This pattern of the seven planets ruling over the twelve signs was known even by the Gnostics two thousand years before I speak these words, although not by their profane Greco-Roman titles as Olympic gods. They were called by the Gnostics the Twelve Aeons, each ruled by one Archon or authority, and these were said to be endowed with the power or right to rule by seven powers. The Twelve Archons include the souls of Cain and Abel, first sons of Adam and Eve, as well as Belus, meaning liar, and Sabaoth, meaning blind, later as seen in Gnostic terms for Satan as the Demiurge. The key to finding how the powers ruled between the twelve authorities in the Gnostic hypostasis of the Archon's myth from two thousand years ago is in the calibration of the inner seven to the outer twelve. The Gnostics, including the historical person upon whom the fictional narratives called the Canon Gospels based their character of Jesus, were, by the Romans occupying Judea, compelled to conceal their knowledge of such esoteric systems of wisdom, and the result was the Christian establishment of seven different regional churches dedicated to the twelve apostles or traveling disciple students of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, even though the pattern of their relationships became a concealment rather than revelation of their true wisdom, the early Christian church fathers recognized that the seven churches were only foundations establishing the seven powers of the seven Olympic gods from the seven visible planets on earth for the twelve apostles, who themselves were only embodiments symbolic of the twelve archons, who each ruled over one aeon, or duration of two thousand years on the calendar of solar precession. All this sounds esoteric today, but was common knowledge to all mankind once. After the Gnostics concealed the calendar of solar precession of twelve aeons as the twelve archons over each and their seven powers between them, and then the Christians further obfuscated these by assembling seven churches under twelve apostles. By the time of the Middle Dark Ages, when Francis Barrett described these seven rulers of the twelve zodiac signs of astrology by the seven sigils of the seven archangels who ruled over the seven days of the standard week. Although the use of such sigils was common in Dark Age grimoires or books of magic, the code word for science at that time, these seven may have a much older origin than Dark Ages Europe. In these pages from early 20th century Kabbalah scholar Sir E. A. Wallace Budge, we see his reproductions of these same seven sigils apparently present as written inside of seven talismans, which originated in pre-Athenian Greece, Attica, and the surrounding Mediterranean islands. These seven talismans signify the seven camia of the Olympic gods of the visible planets. These seven camia, talismanic figures, are even older than the other figures for each depicted alongside them here by Budge. The figure on the left of each row is the pattern of the Hebrew Gematria number square of a certain number of cells associated with each of the seven planets. The figures to the right of these leftmost characters, labeled as the planets, are the spirit sigil, the demon sigil, and the cameo position in the zodiac. These positions in the zodiac show the sigils given by Barrett for the daily archangels positioned within the seven talismanic figures of the seven Olympic Camia. These seven Camia were known and shown within Dark Age grimoires as relating to the seven archangel sigils as well. However, what makes their relationship clear as having originated long before this in pre-Golden Age Greece 
is as symbolizing the seven planetary amulet patterns of the Hebrew Gematria number squares. These date back to the golden era of Greece contemporary to the later Babylonian captivity and repopulation by the earliest diaspora Hebrews to return from Babylonian slavery toward Palestine. Therefore, it is more than likely the related talismanic figures of the seven camia and seven sigils of the archangels date from at least as late as this era as well, and originated in Greece as much as the Hebrew Gematria number squares amulets originated in Babylon and Palestine. The implication of these amulets and talismans is that the knowledge of the seven camia and seven archangel sigils extends back prehistorically beyond even the Gnostics of 2,000 years ago. When we depict the same pattern as that which we can derive by astrology as the seven planets ruling over the twelve zodiac signs using the sigils of the archangels in red and the camia talismanic figures in green, we find the same pattern can be formed from the latter as the former and the latter preceded the former by no fewer than 500 years. Of course, when we subtract all these ancient forms of symbolism from the simplest format to modern understanding of this system, using the seven visible planets as rulers between the twelve zodiac signs of modern astrology, we can understand the truth behind all the intervening aeons of obfuscation by the various religious faiths of the eras. First, around 500 BC, the seven camia talismans and the seven archangel sigils became the seven number squares, amulets, and the twelve aeons. By the time of the events described in the Gospels, the Gnostics, including the real Jesus himself, understood these same concepts as the seven powers of twelve archons. And now we can sum them all up simply by the shorthand symbols for the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac and the seven Olympic planets by simple application of astrology. Let us turn our attention now to studying the Gnostic models from 2,000 years before now to better understand the nature of the soul as it existed according to the students of Kabbalah during the era of the New Testament. We see here again an epitome of the Gnostic mythos described in the hypostasis of the archons, meaning the origin of our authority, or more precisely, the source of our right to rule. We see some names familiar to us from our studies of Torah and its related Apocrypha. However, other names appear unique to this myth and do not recur in any of the other documents describing Gnostic beliefs, even from the same era. This implies that the presence descends from first a realm of seven Kamiya talismans and seven archangel sigils, Atzaluth, to next a realm of seven Gematria number squares and twelve aeons, Yetzira, to a realm of seven powers and twelve archons, Bariah, before being expressed in the modern terms of astrology, Asaya, the seven planets and twelve signs. The reason the Gnostics of his era continued to err by substituting the twelve archons and their seven powers for the twelve aeons and seven number squares, rather than skipping ahead to our own format of astrological application, as he would have predicted, and thus causing the intervention of Christianity's seven churches under twelve apostles, is no mistake on the part of the historical person of Jesus called the Christ. As we shall see next, Gnostic Christian pseudepigrapha, New Testament Gospels era apocrypha, records Jesus Christ as de describing a very complex form of Hakabala. However, nevertheless, the Gnostics passed on their twelve archons over seven powers as the twelve apostles over seven churches as a simple system based on the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac 
and the seven visible planets, when in fact nowhere did Christ describe anything of the sort in any of the writings recording his spoken words. Thus, by the time of modern application to this system of twelve star signs and seven planetary rulers, of the practice of assigning Hebrew and Greek letters to these as well, which could not have originated before modern Hebrew and Greek alphabets replaced Aramaic and Coptic around 2,000 years ago, we have before our eyes now a system that shows a seven-point heptagram within a circle divided into twelve sections. Each of the twelve sections of the divided circle have a letter pair in green, signifying consonants from the Greek alphabet and a letter from the Hebrew alphabet in blue, in addition to a sign from the Babylonian zodiac in red, and each of the seven sections of the divided heptagram within the circle have one of the seven Greek vowels, green, and a letter from the Hebrew alphabet, blue, in addition to the seven visible planetary glyphs, red. In the next section, on Christian Gnostic concepts taught by Jesus himself, according to the New Testament era pseudepigrapha, we will address why we see the heptagram within the circular motif symbolizing the seven churches and twelve apostles, rather than, as we should see, the motif of the five horizontal and three vertical divisions between the seven planets ruling within the twelve zodiac sign circle. The heptagram model has been used by Christians from the time of St. John of Patmos through the life of early 16th century Kabbalist John D., who expressed it as the Sigillum Dei Meth, to the early 20th century Kabbalist Aleister Crowley, who called it the Star of Babylon. This motif, with the labels of the seven Greek vowels in green, seven planetary metals and seven oriental chakras in black, the seven planets in red and seven Hebrew letters in blue, as upon five horizontal and two vertical divisions inside a circle with the labels of Greek, green, signs of the zodiac, red, and Hebrew, blue, we will not return to again. However, this model, with the calibration corrected to year zero, being at the exact nadir of the zodiac circle of aeons in solar precession, should not be underestimated in importance when considering this model was that known to Pythagoras. The Gnostics, Part 1c As discussed in the first lecture on Kabbalah, when the chisel of pure light broke the vessels of lesser light, then the hand of God descended into the cosmos of Isaiah to manifest himself as Adam Cadman, the cosmic template of mankind. When this happened, the realm of Bariah, embodied as the Bereshit Beth cosmology of the Zohar, which had been below, adjacent to Isaiah, the lowest realm of the four worlds of Kabbalah, and the realm of Yetzirah, which had been above, embodied as the thirty-two paths of wisdom from the Sefer Yetzirah, switched places. Before the fall, Bariah was below and Yetzirah was above. In this model, Isaiah was the realm of the cosmos created in seven vast spans of time called cosmic days. Bariah was the Garden of Eden. Yetzirah was the Tree of Life and beyond this was the realm of Atsaluth comprised of Ayin, Ayin Sof, and Ayin Sof Or. After the fall, Bariah and Yetzirah switched places. Bariah had been below, and the Garden of Eden was a real paradise adjacent to the origin of our own cosmos. Yetzirah had been above, and the tree of life had been available at the center of the Garden of Eden and Bariah to anyone in the cosmos of Isaiah who ventured back toward the first day of our cosmos creation. After the fall, Bariah was elevated out of reach from Messiah, and yet Syra descended to stand between mankind and the Garden of Paradise in the form of a seraphim, 
or lightning bolt brazen serpent angel with a fiery sword. In this model, as each moment passes, the entirety of humanity is propelled further and further away from their origin point as a thought in the mind of God beyond the limit of Ain and outer Atsaluth. Although this cosmological model is based on the Zohar, which can be dated to no earlier than 1st century A.D. Sinai Rabbi Simeon Bar Yochai, it is here where our quest for the origins of Christian Gnostic thought begins to take form from the words of Christ. In this model, based on depictions compiled from the Pistis Sophia, also called Eunostus the Blessed, the Christ himself is recorded as relating the names and the relationships expressed by this model. Here we see an upright zodiac, vertical line on the left, of twelve traits, horizontal dashes, describes the body of Ima as she rises through the three descents, circles along the left side line of Abba, across the four realms on the right. The lowest descent is as the word, above this, the will, above this, mind. Christ himself said he had manifested as Pigera Adamas, another term for Adam Cadman, and appeared to Adam and Eve in the garden to judge them for their sin. He described that he had a twin brother who was called a child born from Sophia, the Shekinah, or Bride of God, whom Christ called the Autogenes. This twin was the Gnostic Demiurge, or evil creator of all, called Samael, meaning the blind, and was the spirit of Satan whom had possessed the accursed serpent, and whom, as such, had bred with Eve. According to the Christ in Pistis Sophia, Eve and Samael bare two offspring, one was called yad heh the Tetragrammaton name of God. The other was called Elohim, the contemporary substitution in scribal colophons for Adonai, an earlier title of God pre-Babylonian captivity. yad heh was the God of all good, and Elohim the devil of all evils. According to various legends of the Jews collected from oral traditions by Louis Ginsburg in the 19th century, as well as provided in Hebrew manuscript and English translation both by Steve Savidow, late 20th century Kabbalist, there is a book available to this day that originated as a grimoire or book of magic, proto-science, given to Adam immediately after his and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden, by an angel, described as an Ethiopian in some sources, named Raziel. Supposedly, the book of Raziel described all the visions Adam had once seen while in paradise, but which he would now never see again following the expulsion. This model shows us the combination of several Gnostic apocryphal sources' descriptions to relate them all into one larger model containing them all. In the central portion of the Gnostic model for the events following the expulsion is this tetractus of ten characters within three sectors or zones. In Eden above are Christ as Pigera Adamas or Adam Cadman, immortal Eve, and the demiurge twin of Christ called Yaldabaoth, meaning the blind. Immortal Eve and Yaldabaoth came together to conceive Cain as immortal and wise. But Cain dwelt in purgatory, and was torn between the twin-headed spirits of yad heh and Elohim, good and evil, and who eventually succumbed to sin when he himself killed his brother Abel, whom immortal Eve had conceived with Pigera Adamas, Christ. Abel had occupied all three realms, living in Eden with Adam and Eve, in the mortal realm with Seth and the fallen Adam and Eve, and finally dying at the hands of his brother Cain in purgatory. Because Cain and Abel were born of Eve while she was immortal, 
They were giants called Nephilim. Cain was born evil and Abel good. However, the third son of Adam and Eve, from whom we are supposedly all descended, Seth, was conceived after the fall and expulsion from paradise. This diagram is compiled from the description of relationships between these Genesis Torah characters from the Gnostic secret apocryphon of John, an apostle of Jesus Christ, from words supposedly spoken by Jesus Christ himself. All of this occurred in and around the Garden of Eden, that is, the realm of Bariah within the four worlds of the Kabbalah, when it was still below Yetzira and above Esaia. Yetzira was present within the Garden of Eden as the seven principles expressed on the right comprised of the middle path of the combined trees of life and knowledge. In Eden, the tree of life was granted Adam and Eve to eat from and to be immortal. However, Adam and Eve, deceived by the serpent, ate the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge, and that resulted in their expulsion from Eden. When this happened, Adam and Eve were cursed to eat from only the tree of knowledge, and then they saw the tree of life turn into the tree of death, and Eden, as the realm of Bariah, ascend beyond their reach, protected now by the seraphim angel with a flaming sword, upon a lattice shaped alike the thirty-two mystical paths of wisdom from Sefer Yetzirah's description of the tree of knowledge of Kabbalah. Thus we see that the cursed nature of man is to be driven forth away from his home by the will of God. The path of attaining and achieving prolonged Christ consciousness is a path of recapitulation, reuniting the mind of a person with the Godhead of their Creator. Scaling backward the seven days removes the sevenfold curse placed upon the seven generations and the seventh son of the seventh son. Scaling the tree of knowledge, we return into the Garden of Eden and can approach through the lower and upper realms described in the Bereshit Beth volume of Zohar into the presence of the Abba and Ima consciousnesses within the mind of God. And once we have returned into the Garden of Eden, we may look down toward Asaya from above Pariah, and we may look to Yetzirah on our side, for we shall see the four worlds as they were before the fall, when Asaya was below Bariah, Bariah below Yetzira, and Yetzira below Atzaluth. Here again, from a position outside of and beyond the Tetractus of ten Sephirot of Yetzira in Eden, on the same level as the lowest aspects of the Autogenes, the hind parts of God, in Ayan Sof R, Atzaluth. Here we see that the Autogenes, God, is the immortal son of an eternal father, and that God, in turn, procreated with Sophia to beget Christ, also called Piger Adamas, or Adam Cadman, the mental template for human evolution. Just as in the Gnostic Gospel, the Pistis Sophia, we can see it was with the autogenies that Sophia procreated to beget Christ as Pigera Adamas, but that it was purely from forethought or clairvoyance, the female aspect of wisdom, that Sophia, the mother of Christ, begat Christ's twin brother, Samael the Demiurge. It was Samael who, following Eve's eating the forbidden fruit on the tree of knowledge, seduced her and raped her to sire by her the twin-headed devil god of yad and Elohim, whom Christ is recorded as calling the Error of Moses, author of the Torah of the Old Testament of the Bible. So we see this tangled web woven by these ten in Eden, with Christ fucking immortal Eve, immortal Eve fucking Yaldabaoth, Yaldabaoth fucking mortal Eve, and mortal Eve fucking mortal Adam, all under the watchful eye of the Autogenes fucking Sophia. Moreover, once the family are expelled from Eden and enter the land of Nod to the east of Eden, there are other mortals, 
the wives of Cain and Seth, as well as others like Cain, the Nephilim giants, titans, or sons of God. To the mortals who lived in Nod, the family from Eden were called the Anunnaki. By the lifetime of seven Nephilim giants, sons of Cain, and twelve mortal humans, sons of Seth, a flood was sent by God to destroy all life on earth. It was in this era when Enos, son of Seth, and Enoch, son of Cain, were born. When Adam and Eve moved with Seth into Nod, Cain, who had slain his brother Abel, went into exile in the land to the north, called later Edom, Edom was a land of red clay caves believed to have been in what is now modern Gaza, Palestine. This was when, from the wives of men in Nod, Seth and Cain both chose wives, with whom Seth bore Enos and Cain bore Enoch. Thus the Nephilim giants of Edom established five kingdoms, the ruler of each of which was a Nephilim, and who were called, collectively, the five kings of Edom. Then the flood came to destroy all life on earth. It was sent to snuff out man, the giants, and all animals. The real reason the flood occurred at that time was natural. It happened when it did because of the shifting of our planet that occurs over the durations of aeons, according to the solar measurement of Earth's polar precession. Thus, just as Yaldabaoth, as Samael, bred with immortal Eve in one aeon to conceive Cain, in the next aeon, Yaldabaoth coupled with mortal Eve to conceive Yadhevate, Enoch, and Elohim, Enos. Insofar as Yaldabaoth signifies the entirety of the round of twelve aeons in the form of the twelve archons, there are aeons of Samael, Cain, and Abel on the usual wheel of the twelve archons, as well as nine others whose names remain mysterious, aside from to researchers of the pre-diluvial apocryphal book of Enoch, where they are described as the other Nephilim giants. Thus, each of the fallen angels or Nephilim giants ruled as an archon over one of the twelve aeons. As described in the last lecture, the twelve Archon rulers over the seven powers was a prototype model for what we now know as the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac and the seven visible planets. Here we see Cain and Abel with Belus between them, and Sabaoth on the opposite side. This is because it was Samael who conceived Cain with immortal Eve, but it was Belus who conceived Abel with mortal Eve. Samael, the Demiurge, is the twin brother of Pigera Adamus, or Christ, and so it was he who deceived immortal Eve by pretending to be his twin, Pigera Adamus, Adam Cadman, or Cosmic Man, and thus it was also he, Samael or Yaldabaoth, who conceived the plan to go down to the wives of men and to breed with them, and who thus became the fallen angels or Nephilim giants described by Enoch. It is said that of those who went along with his original plan, only Sabaoth repented. In Enoch, the name of the leader of the fallen angels, the Anunnaki or Grigori, is Shamiaza. Shem, literally, means the name. So, shem means the name Aza. Thus, it was Azrael, the fallen angel, whom the others followed. They made a pact to go down to the wives of men and make them their own. Shemiaza was their leader, however, eventually, we are told by Gnostic scriptures also, Sabaoth repented. But Sabaoth was Yaldabaoth, who was Samael or Sacklus, who was Shemiaza, who was Azrael, who was Raziel. All of these are names for the same fallen angel, cognate to the Christian Lucifer, who became Satan when cast out of heaven at the same time as Adam and Eve were cast out of Eden. The Golden Dawn, Part 1D 
As we descended in previous lectures from the tree of life of Yetzirah before the fall to the tree of death of Yetzirah after the fall, we study now the tree of knowledge as the main aspect of HaKabbalah today. Likewise, we who study HaKabbalah today are no strangers to the concept of the slippage of the middle pillar from this arrangement described by Isaac Luria, the blind, to this arrangement, designed by the Ari of the Safed school, showing the lowest Sephirot, Malkuth, the kingdom, on the tree of knowledge to have slipped down one notch from its position on the tree of life. This was the tree of knowledge diagram used by Kabbalists from the era of the Dark Ages until the turn of the 20th century. At the turn of the 20th century, Around the time Yehuda Ashlag was completing his commentary on the whole 23-volume Zohar in Hebrew, an Englishman named S. L. McGregor Mathers translated a small portion of the already abridged Tikkuni Zohar into English, calling it Kabbalah Dinudata. In Mathers' translation, he shows the anatomy of God as Adam Kadman, overlaid by the tree of knowledge of the ten sephirot. Thus, we may finally see the equivalent for Adam Kadman of the twelve signs of the zodiac placed up and down the body of the Shekinah. Mather's Kabbalah di Nudata offers the most comprehensive guide for completely comprehending her Kabbalah at the turn of the 20th century. Shortly before the publication by Mathers of Kabbalah di Nudata, the French Kabbalist Eliphas Levy was working on depictions for the various concepts he had learned from a study of the Tikkuni Zohar in Hebrew. As we saw in the earlier lecture on Adam Kadman, Levy provides us with this depiction of God lowering himself into the cosmos of the four worlds of Kabbalah. Levy has chosen the hexagram pattern to depict this concept. Also using the hexagram around the same time as Levy, who used it to symbolize a Kabbalistic process of God descending into the cosmos, was Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, founder of the Theosophical Society, devoted to rewriting the story of the Bible to incorporate the wealth of New Age thoughts in Europe at that time, who used the hexagram as a symbol for the Western mystery tradition, the right-hand path, contrasted to the swastika, symbolic to theosophy of the Eastern tradition, the left-hand path. In the earlier version of the Theosophical Society's logo designed by H. P. Blavatsky herself, the hexagram contains her own initials, is crowned by the same swastika logo later used by the Nazis, and surrounded by an Ouroboros, or snake eating its own tail. In the later version of the Theosophical Logos Society, redesigned after H. P. Blavatsky's death, the hexagram contains an Ankh cross. The swastika is switched to its arrangement as a traditional symbol of Buddhism, and outside the Ouroboros is the slogan, there is no religion higher than truth, a common saying from the era of rationalism and reason following the Enlightenment a century before. The significance of changing this logo was due to the original Blavatsky orientation of the swastika being adopted by the Nazis. However, this subtle difference has been overlooked by far too many subsequent and even modern day followers of Blavatsky's theosophical rewriting of the biblical myths. Her intention was to form the mythological aspect of a New Age religion that was missing only one aspect, a secret doctrine, a single working dogma that could unify the whole plotline for her mythological rewrites. As a result of this original adoption by the Nazis of Blavatsky's symbol signifying the East or the Oriental left-hand path to enlightenment, the error persists to this day that the Nazis were perpetuating the lineage of the Eastern secret chiefs or transcended Mahatmas 
whom Blavatsky claimed constant contact with. The symbol shown here from the modern Rileyan UFO cult, containing the Nazi-oriented swastika inside the hexagram, perverts Blavatsky's intended meaning of these symbols as the Eastern and the Western mystery traditions to mean the Nazis and the Zionist Hebrew diaspora who stole Palestine from the indigenous Muslim Semites to form the nation of Israel. Before there was a nation of Israel, or a Nazi party Third Reich in Germany, following Blavatsky and Levy's use of the hexagram symbolism, a group was formed by English and French Freemasons and Rosicrucians devoted to the study of Kabbalah and calling themselves the Golden Dawn, who attempted to unify the entire Western mystery tradition into a single cohesive whole in the form of knowledge lectures given in an order along with initiation rituals given per degree. The logo of the Golden Dawn was thus a hexagram showing a sunrise above an ocean, meaning their summing up of the Western mystery tradition was an attempt to provide Blavatsky's myths with a working dogma to unify her New Age mythology. The origin of the founding charter for the first Golden Dawn group, the so-called cipher manuscripts, remains a mystery in itself. However, regardless of their origin, the works done on Hakabalistic topics and concepts by the members of the Golden Dawn group were entirely their own work, and a wonderful collection of additions to Kabbalistic Western mystery tradition. In this Golden Dawn depiction of Adam Cadman as Christ, we see the angels whose wings support him are labeled R.C. for Rosy Cross, that his body contains the 32 mystical paths of wisdom of the Tree of Knowledge, and that he stands on a globe between the symbols of the sun and moon, signifying earth as Malkuth, the kingdom. In this Golden Dawn group depiction of the Garden of Eden prior to the fall of man, we find God as an older Adam Cadman, suspended by the Sephirot on a cross before twin pillars, below which stands Shekinah, surrounded by fourteen branches, the seven planets twice, on the Tree of Life, atop the coiled representation of the seven-headed serpent called Set by the Egyptian, Typhon by the Greeks, and Satan by the Hebrews. The Fall of Man, as described by Israel Regardi and A. E. Waite, members of the Golden Dawn group, resulted from the shattering of the shells in the layers between the three Hakabalistic worlds above Isaiah and when it was mimicked within the spiritual composition of man, caused his fall from immortal Cadman to mortal Adam, and resulted in his exile from paradise. According to Waite, Rigardi, Mathers, Crowley, and the others in the Golden Dawn group, this slippage of the middle pillar results in an eleventh non sephirot opening on the middle pillar between Kether the crown sephirot at the apex, and tiferet, meaning beauty and positioned above the heart along the middle pillar of man's spiritual composition, the template of Adam Cadman. This hole within the figurative veil of the abyss, they named death, meaning knowledge, after gnosis, meaning the quest to know. In this second Golden Dawn group depiction of the Garden of Eden, we see the same characters after the fall of man and the expulsion from paradise. Below the triple-faced angel, we see the Sephirot as a flaming sword. Above the arms of the cross, we behold the four elements, and consuming Adam Cadman and the Sephirot on the cross are the seven heads of the great Leviathan, the red dragon of revelations, loosed from the pit by Eve. In this golden dawn depiction, we see the seven-headed serpent called Set Typhon, or simply Satan, consuming Lilith, Adam's first wife before Eve, who we behold crucified onto a cross alike the Christian mythos of Jesus Christ. And in this depiction from the golden dawn era of 20th century Kabbalism, 
we see the three supernal sephirot on a tree of knowledge with lowered middle pillar sephirot where Adam Cadman, the cosmic template as an old man, stands with his crown in death, his arms extended above the left and right columns below their supernal caps, and his feet resting upon Malkuth, the kingdom, the Nader Sephirot. So we see that now, at the turn of the 21st century A.D., we who study Kabbalah have come a long way from the origins of our craft in studying the nature of our cosmos. In this familiar depiction from the mid-20th century Philosophical Research Society, a later adjunct of the Golden Dawn Group, of Adam Cadman as a philosophical atlas, supporting the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac at the levels of Death and the veil of the abyss, and covered over by the seven orbits of the planets at the level of the veil of the temple, with one foot on land and one foot in the sea, alike the angel of revelations. The western path of ascending the ten sephirot on the tree of knowledge is the path to reunion of one's being with one's own genius, higher self, or holy guardian angel. This path forms the quest set upon by the soul, once it awakens within the body while alive or at the time of death, and sets its desire to returning to reunion with the single, omniversal spirit of Adam Cadman's Godhead mind. The one soul is a microcosm reflecting the one spirit as a macrocosm. Hence, we are all gods, and reflections of God in one another's eyes, and all of us together are the one true God. In Legends Part 2 The East Part 2a The Atman Part 2a1 Similar Systems Just as in Hakabala's Sefer Yetzirah, the origin of mankind's knowledge and understanding of the meta-pattern mold for human capacity for oneness with divinity are the ten fingers signifying the ten sephirot emanations on the tree of knowledge and thus representing also the manner of clasping the hands together in supplicant prayer during her Kabbalistic meditation. So, too, in the far eastern orient do we find this ornate alabaster replica of a human hand showing all the eldest Vedic equivalents to modern aspects of palmistry. The fingertips are shown as all one type of shell, the first knuckle as five types of gems, the second finger bones as eyes, the second knuckles as five types of flower, the usual mounds of the planets showing the planets in color and vivid detail, and lines shown as Vedic gods Ganesh, Hanuman, and Shiva, symbolizing the trinity of past, present, and future, are the same as in modern Western palmistry. Likewise, just as in the Western mystery tradition, a Kabbalah is expressed as four worlds, and these four worlds are seen as equivalent to the four elemental forces of nature, on earth below and in the cosmos above, as seen here arranged, blue for water, red for fire, green for earth, and yellow for air, clockwise from the upper right, surrounding spirit, the fifth element shown as a local wheel from Buddhism, in a pentagram formation. So too in the Vedic Eastern Oriental version of Kabbalah are there four elements also, or tattvas, called from left to right Tejas, red triangle of fire, Patavati, yellow square of earth, Vajas, gray crescent of air, Apas, blue circle of water, and Acacia, purple ovum. Each of these, as shown, contain the others to form the 25 tattvas elements of the material world. Likewise, just as in the Western mystery tradition, there is the element throughout the myths regarding the number seven, 
from the seven archangel sigils over each day of the week and seven cameo talismans showing these sigils places in the zodiac. And just as there are seven gematria number squares, seven Olympic gods of the visible planets, seven powers of the Gnostic archons, seven Christian churches founded by apostles, seven lower sephirot subtended to the supernal trinity, seven Greek vowels and correspondent Hebrew letters, etc. So too in the far eastern orient there is a system of seven attributes that is well known and far more ancient than even the Babylonian zodiac. The seven chakras, or five nerve centers in the spine and two in the brain, form the evolutionary ladder up which our nervous system grows over time. These nerve centers, when considered in one's own human body, are held as infinitely more important in the East for understanding the nature of one's own soul and for achieving the full capacity for one's potential development than all the correspondences in 777 could ever be. Furthermore, just as in the Western mystery tradition, we have the typical wheel of twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac, which can be read in the usual direction, from Aries around to Pisces, for the twelve annual months per one solar year, or read in the opposite direction, from Pisces around to Aries, to measure the two thousand year each twelve solar aeons in a calendar based on polar precession. So too do we find in the far eastern oriental Chinese calendar an identical system of twelve zoo animals. However, rather than measuring months or aeons, each measures a single year in a never-ending 12-year cycle. For example, I was born in 1977, in the year of the snake. The year of the snake repeated in 1989, and in 2001, and will repeat again in 2013. Such is the Chinese equivalent to the Babylonian zodiac showing constellations in the night sky. Lastly, even the concept of assigning the twelve signs of the Babylonian zodiac to aspects of the anatomy of an upright human being originated in the Far Eastern Orient. This middle dark ages graphic depicts an open torso dissection of a human cadaver labeling each part with a sign from the Babylonian zodiac. This model is very much like the standard Chinese diagram of similar applications from the schools on the twelve Qi meridians for a good reason. They describe the same system. The concept of the twelve Qi meridian system, developed by Chinese Taoists, is based entirely on actual human physiological anatomy, structured such that each of the twelve meridians, nerve fibers extended from the spine into the face and torso organs and the extremities of the limbs, branches forth from one of the seven chakras, nerve centers along the spine and inside the brain. Similar meridians have been found occurring in other mammals, such as horses and dogs, However, beyond this, more research does not remain forthcoming with the current Communist Party ban on the study of Kui Gong, Tai Chi, in China. The Atman, Part 2A2 two two. Seven Chakras, Twelve Meridians, and the Akashic Aura The seven chakras are the Muladhara, Root, Svadhisthana, Sacral, Manupura, Solar Plexus, Anahata, Heart, Vushududa, Throat, Ajna, Pineal, and Sahasrara, Fontanelle. When Chi energy called phi, electrochemical transduction by Freud, is channeled upward along this circuitry. The energy's wavelength patterns move toward a faster vibration of the ultraviolet photoelectric effect, 
elevating the brain waves toward alpha state. Just so, when chi energy is channeled downward along this circuitry, the energy's wavelength patterns move toward a slower vibration of an infrared photoelectric effect, decreasing brain wave activity toward gamma state. The usual symbolic depiction of the seven chakras is, thus, as the seven color spectrum of a rainbow, with the root chakra in red and the crown chakra in violet. Likewise, the simplicity or complexity and the geometric shape that forms the pattern of each is unique from every other. The crown chakra is a violet, 1,000-petaled lotus blossom. The third eye chakra is two lotus petals around a downward triangle and indigo. The throat chakra is 16 petals surrounding a downward-pointing triangle containing a circle in blue. The heart chakra has 12 petals around a hexagram in green. The solar plexus chakra has 10 petals around a downward pointing triangle in yellow. The sacral plexus chakra has 6 petals around a crescent moon glyph in orange. The base chakra is 4 petals around a square surrounding a downward triangle in red. The Chinese model of 12 nerve fiber meridians stemming outward from the spinal column's main trunk of neurons connecting the brain to the body has been proven science since its initial discovery and application some time before 2,500 years ago. By applying acupressure to pressure point nerve centers along these meridians, one can relieve stress from other parts of, and or from the whole of, the nervous system of the recipient. This can be amplified using acupuncture with needles. However, it can also be accomplished by simple person-to-person -person dermal transduction, as taught and called Reiki, laying on of hands healing technique. According to the basic chart of the 12 Chinese meridians, they each affect different areas of the body and control the various organs located there. Thus, some are singular and dorsal, others lateral and symmetric. That there should be 12 meridians emanating from the seven chakras is no huge surprise to a student of Kabbalah. It may be taken as proof for intelligent design which, however, in turn leads to no proof of any greater good or God, greater intellect or species, etc. God could have designed this sort of system to evolve naturally given our cosmos conditions over time, and then left us here to fester and rot. Likewise, any alien species could have unwarranted, altered our ape genetics into the human genome, and then vanish to leave us here to fester and rot. The final form of the Far Eastern Oriental system of religious metaphysics to be considered is this triune nature of the aura. Here we see the aura as being a seven rainbow spectrum color field surrounding our body with an invisible energy, outermost violet, innermost red, symbolizing the solidity or aridity of the energy field's density relative to distance from the core of the aura, the seven chakras of the spine. The inside of the aura is thus a reflection of the seven chakras as a rainbow. There are three basic components to the aura, or personal electromagnetic signature pattern. One, the interior of the aura, 2. The surface dividing the interior or of the aura from the exterior world around it. And 3. The world exterior to the aura. Because the aura surrounds a person with an energy field roughly akin to a soap bubble, the physical plane is the air within the soap bubble, the astral plane is the surface of the bubble itself, and the spiritual plane is the air in the realm beyond the soap bubble's surface. 
If the ratio of pressure, density, gravity, or general force is off between the atmosphere inside the aura and the atmosphere outside the aura, the aura layer between them is disturbed like waves on a pond stirred by the wind. To return to the seven chakra in more detail, we first examine each in color in descending order from the violet crown to the indigo third eye to the blue throat to the green heart to the yellow solar to the orange sacral to the red root to see that then the chi energy flowing through the circuit returns upward around the exterior surface of our outer aura. Likewise, we will see each chakra now in rising order from base to crown, which results in the chi returning downward around the interior surface of our outer aura. The root chakra, Muladhara, is associated with the color red, has four petals each, associated with one letter from the Sanskrit alphabet, and is symbolized by the elephant of Ganesha. The seed syllable is lamb. The sacral plexus chakra, Svadhisthana, is associated with the color orange, has six petals, each associated with one Sanskrit letter, and features the crocodile of Varuna, symbolizing Brahma. The seed syllable is Vam. The solar plexus chakra, Manipura, is associated with the color yellow, has ten petals, each with a correspondent Sanskrit letter, and its he-ram animal symbolizes Rudra. The seed syllable is Ram. The heart chakra, Anahata, is associated with the color green, has twelve petals, each with its own unique Sanskrit letter, and its she-goat animal symbolizes Shiva. The seed syllable is Yam. The throat chakra, Vishuddha, is associated with the color blue, has 16 petals with one Sanskrit letter on each, and is symbolized by an elephant. The seed syllable is Ham. The third eye, Ajna or Bindu chakra, is associated with the color indigo, has two petals with one Sanskrit letter on each. The seed syllable is Om. The crown chakra, Sahasara, is associated with the color violet and is symbolized by a 1,000-petaled lotus blossom unifying the rising female Shakti Kundalini energy and the sinking male Shiva Chi energy. The seed syllable is Silence. To return to the twelve meridians in more detail, we first examine that each appendage to the body, including the head, acts as a microcosm of the torso, and so all contain twelve meridian lines. The twelve meridian lines of the skull surround and crisscross the face, connecting between the cheek muscles as well as above the scalp line where only nerves and not muscles comprise the tissues interior to the epidermis. The human hand, in addition to being a microcosm reflecting the seven planets, twelve zodiac signs, and five of the ten sephirot, the human hand's neurons meridians are a microcosm of the rest of the body. The spine aligns along the outside of the thumb, the seven chakras with points on the palm, the arms, the eyes, legs, and nose correspond to the four other digits tips from the index to the little finger outward from the thumb. The human feet, also, 
are a microcosm divided apart into 12 meridian zones that correspond to other parts of the body, including the eyes, ears, and internal organs. The feet, with five toes each, the hands, with five fingers each, and the head, with, besides the eye sockets, five orifices, all together form the five appendages around the torso. To many, this pentacular symbol of living beings all over this planet is proof of intelligent design. However, the connections provided thus far remain dubious. Because of the twelve petals in Sanskrit letters of its form, the heart chakra, Anahata, is thought to be the origin place for the sending and receiving of electrochemical pulsed signals between the twelve peripheral meridians and the seven central chakras. The heart chakra symbol is the hexagram star, the so-called Star of David from the Western mystery tradition, and symbolizing the conjoining of male, the upward triangle, descending, and female, the downward triangle, elevating. The heart chakra's color is green and seed syllable sound is yam. The internal electrochemical system is such that there are 21 acupuncture pressure points for the spleen meridians, 9 for the heart, 19 for the small intestine, 67 for the bladder, 27 for the kidney, 9 for the pericardium, 23 for the triple burner meridians, 44 for the gallbladder, 14 for the liver, 11 for the lung, 20 for the larger intestine, 45 for the stomach, 28 for the governing vessel meridians, 24 for the conception vessel or gamete cells, with five possible extra points motive and central to tension excitation within the nervous system. There are, thus, upwards of 300 acupressure, acupuncture, pressure points. The manner the interior electrochemical cathexis of surplus chi energy, resulting in Freud's concept of ego, occurs, and the manner the interior energy passes the dermal barrier and forms the auric field around the living body, yet elude many modern scientists, but not mystics who have worked with this system for aeons. Here we see the doubling of the yellow solar plexus, blue throat, and indigo ajna chakras to resemble the sephirot pattern on the tree of knowledge, showing matter below and spirit above the exterior aura, with yang, the male Tao stick symbolizing negative or zero, on the body's right, and yin, the female Tao rod symbol of positive or one, on the body's left, such is the simple, natural structure of the soul, according to the Far Eastern Oriental concept of it as the Atman. The Atman, Part 2A3, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. The being history knows yet to this day as the wise sage began life around the date we now call 563 BC, around the time of the early golden age of Greek society. He was born a prince to Queen Mahamaya of the Kilia clan and King Sudhadona of the Shakya clan. He grew up in opulent luxury until one day he rejected his material wealth and fled to the wilderness to live in the style of an ascetic monk. Following a period of self-renunciation and emancipating emaciation, Siddhartha returned to society again, this time as the Buddha, 
arguably the wisest religious teacher of all time. The greatest trick the Buddha ever pulled was to transcend existence entirely. He simply became so enlightened with wisdom that he disappeared from material reality. He did not die. He did not live. He did not unlive nor undie. He simply stopped being. Similar feats of transubstantiation of flesh to pure spirit are rare, but not absent, in the Western traditional myths. Enoch and Jesus both vanished from the face of the earth, and both have since seemed to be able to reappear at will to serve as messengers for the word of God. The myth of Enoch being translated into the Metatron angel, and the myth of Jesus transubstantiating three days after his death by crucifixion, both bear similarities and differences to this myth of Buddha. The Buddha sat beneath the Bodhi tree and meditated until he confronted his own innermost self as a reflection in the water. He named the reflection of his own innermost self Mara, and facing his fear of Mara, defeated it, and facing his fear of losing Mara, defeated that too. And when he had defeated Mara, and Mara vanished powerless, the Buddha Siddhartha Gautama transcended. Because the Buddha saw his goal of transcending reality as an ultimate good, he manifested his self opposed to it as the ultimate evil. In this Tibetan Buddhist Tonka painting from the Himalayan mountains, we see the six-armed form of Vajra, the male counterpart of the Hindu goddess Kali. Kali reigns over one short span on the calendar of solar aeons. However, her yuga is considered extremely unlucky. Vajra is the male version of Kali, and Kali Yuga is a period of time on a solar aeon calendar. Vajra, the male concept of a period of time marked by very bad luck. This depiction of Vajra is a depiction of a wrathful deity, mind state, which is nothing but a negative reflection of the self, and can be changed to a peaceful deity reflection simply by calming the mind state. When Buddha applied this method of existential implosion of all referential meanings surrounding and reinforcing the misperceived illusory appearance of materially existent reality to his own reflection, he found he could not only influence the ripples on the surface with his thoughts, but could communicate to the reflection that then arose through the pond surface from the other side of the mirror. As the reflection he manifested became more and more tangible, Buddha himself became less and less so, and instead more and more ethereal. He embodied the five tattvas and the seven chakras, held his hands in mudras, and chanted a mantra. As he dissolved into oneness with the Sri Yantra, he was gradually shedding his innermost self, his ego, trait by trait, into the evil Mara. In this Tibetan Tonka painting, we see the wheel of the six lokas, or realms of bodily reincarnation after the death of one's own currently living body now. The revolution of ev evolution through these six local realms is clockwise around the wheel. The wheel of six lokas or worlds we can reincarnate into are clockwise from upper right. The world of fools, the world of hell where we are tortured by demons, the world of creatures where we come back as an animal, the world of philosophers, the world of sages, and the world of Buddha. This six loka wheel spins forever under the ever-unblinking third eye of Vajra 
the male Kali of the Yuga. And as this six local realm became more manifest, Buddha became less manifest. Then Buddha said to Mara, There is no you, for you are only a reflection of me, and there is no longer such a thing as me. With this, Mara, the reflection of Buddha's self, ceased to exist, and as he saw his own reflection evaporate from the pond below him, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha also ceased to exist. He achieved the trance state called Samadhi by Buddhists and Nirvana by Hindus. He became pure mind and ceased being matter. The East Part 2B The Gods Part 2B 1 Churning the Sea of Milk At the Temple of Angkor Wat in Cambodia, we find this high-relief carving of the divas of all good and the asuras of all evil playing tug-of-war on a snake wrapped around a pole in the middle between the good and evil demigods. Hanuman, the monkey god, perches atop this pillar. This column penetrates through a hole beneath the feet of the demigods and churns the sea of milk. That is, the Milky Way galaxy is caused to rotate into its six spiral arms around its core by this action. The result, the stardust that seeds life onto planets like our own at key times, was called Amrita, the elixir of immortal life. A separate low relief, also from the Angkor Wat temple, depicts the same scene. At the extreme furthest right end of the serpent, on the side with the good divas, pulls Indra, his triple-faced form symbolizing himself as Vishnu, Buddha, and Krishna in one. The serpent itself is Vasuki, king of the Naga, the snake gods, there is little hope in achieving through this brief presentation the immense scope of scale and size the Angkor Wat carving covers. It wraps around an entire pagoda of the temple and is intricately carved in sandstone with 88 divas and 92 asuras on either side of the central pillar motif. We see here the central pillar presided over by Vishnu in his forearm form. In one hand, Vishnu holds a sword. In another hand, he holds a nautilus snail shell symbolic of the elixir vitae of Buddhist heritage, called Soma. In the other two hands, he holds the enormous serpent king Vasuki, assisting the divas on the right and Asuras on the left, in their task of churning the sea of milk. Across another vast distance of figures, pulling the snake like a rope, this time a long, repetitive cycle, duplicating the same characteristics of the first in the series the entire subsequent number of times. Just as there were 88 divas, angels, to the right side of Vishnu at the center, so too are there ninety-two Asuras, demons, to the left. Following this vast distance of stylistically stamped, individual hand-carved lesser minions, we arrive at the character on the opposite side of Vishnu from Indra. Just as Indra symbolized Vishnu in the future, and Vishnu stood for himself in the present. Then the past form of Vishnu was King Bali, a natural-born Asura who nevertheless conquered the universe of all the other Asuras, the Divas, 
and even of Indra. Bali ultimately lost the entirety of his empire when Vishnu, in the avatar of Vamana, tricked Bali into granting it back to him. The record of these events in Rigvedic history describes Vishnu's betrayal of his ally, Bali, against Indra. However, the cause Vishnu brought good King Bali of the evil Asuras and the Demiurge, Indra, over the good Divas together four, depicted on the walls of Angor Wat in plural places, that is, the churning of the Sea of Milk, was more important than their prior rivalry. Vishnu, it turned out, was only testing King Bali to strengthen him by his apparent betrayal, and Vishnu was only testing Indra to strengthen him by siding with his opponent, King Bali. Thus, from this series of tests, Vishnu elected King Bali and his 92 Asura demons to hold on to the head of Naga, King Vasuki, while the position of holding the tail of the great snake was allotted to Indra and his army of 88 loyal divas. The entire premise is a metaphor for three traits of the forward-flowing time stream in the past to future direction, measured by the arrow of entropy. The Hindu Trimurti of Brahma the Creator, Vishnu the Preserver, and Shiva the Destroyer form the same dialectical corkscrew-shaped cycle over time. Contemporary to the height of Vedic-era civilization, in the Indus River Valley of the Indian subcontinent was the unification of the upper, southern, and lower northern kingdoms of the Nile River Valley of northeastern Africa. Both depicted many of the same ideas in their cosmological alphabetic pantheon. While the Rig Vedas described the Naga King Snake Vasuki extended between the good divas and the evil asuras, tied about a pole and pulled to churn the sea of milk. We see in this image the ancient Egyptian equivalent for this conception of time in their expansion of the single moment of death, symbolized as the weighing of the soul. Here we see Knum fashioning a man's body to the left, while Thoth ibis-headed ancient Egyptian embodiment of the cosmic force of time counts the man's days on the right. Between them, weighing the man's soul, are Anubis, the jackal of death, and Sobek, the crocodile version in Egypt of the Greek three-headed blind dog Cerberus, guardian of the gateway to hell. The man's heart is on the left side of the scales, while a feather is on the right. To wrap all these anthropo-anamorphic pantheons of embodiments of elemental forces forming a single unified model of the entire cosmos up into one, the Vedic, the Egyptian, and the Babylonian versions all express different points of view and ways to measure the same original system. If we consider Thoth as symbolic of time, Vajra Kali as symbolic of time, the Hindu Trimurti as symbolic of time, and if we consider the Naga King Vasuki as symbolic of time also, then we cannot deny what we are looking at here is an ancient version of the modern hard science fields of astrophysics and quantum mechanics. And of course, also liberal arts like philosophy and theater. The three gods over past, present, and future of the Trimurti, the rough cube of space, and the perfected cube over time concepts of Thoth, later called Hermes in Greek, and as one of the seven Olympic gods, called in Rome 
Mercury, and even the six loka reincarnative worlds Wheel of Vajra are all geometrically depictable as symbols for stages in evolutionary development over time. The trinity is triangle, the cube is square, and the six lokas is a pentagon of five sides around a central sixth point within, appear as the first symmetric, self-similar polygons in two dimensions, and the only three known to be useful in three dimensions in constructing regular polyhedral solids. The Gods, Part 2, B, 2 The Calendar of the Gods We shall begin by looking at the Shimham Farash, that is, the 72-letter long name of God. Just as there are the 99 names of Allah in Islam, there are twelve names of God in Hakabalah, though there are more titles than official names. The words officially meaning name of God in Hebrew, Baal Shem, themselves have become a title. The twelve Baal Shema of the gods studied in Hakabalah are the monogrammata, Alpha and Omega or Tau, the Digrammata, Yadhe equals Ja, Al equals Allah, etc., the Trigrammata, I am equals Yadheva, Father equals Aba. The Tetragrammata, yad heh Elohim, Adonai, etc. The Octogrammaton, A-H-D-V-N-H-A-Y. The Decagrammaton, K-T-H-R, Ch-K-M-A. B N H the dodecagrammaton a tripled tetragrammaton the fourteen letter name Adonai Elohino Adonai the twenty two letter name Avraham Yitchak Yaakov Yeshurun the thirty three letter name Adonai El Eloha, Elohim, Shaddai, Tseviot, Ehei, Yah, Yadhevade. The 42 letter name, the Notericon of the Anabekeoch prayer, and the 72 or 216 letter name, the Shimham Farash. The Shimham Farash, which we see in this 17th century printing by Athanasius Kircher, is either 72 or 216 letters long because it consists of 72 names of angels whose names are three letters long each. As we will come to see in a moment by studying the history of Shimham Farash, these 72 three-letter-long named angels accomplished many miracles, but most importantly, we will come to understand how the original Shemham Farash acted as a symbolic calendar. By studying the history of this name of God, or Baal Shem, we will uncover the nature of this calendar's origins and learn the mechanisms of its use. This calendar, although originating in the era before the Flood, was not considered a calendar of any gods then. It was the first form of attempt at the sort of calendars we use today, made by our earliest cave-dwelling hominid ancestors. It is thus important to remember 
that this calendar was originally invented by a cave person, one of our earliest Homo sapien ancestors, and is thus one of the most simple and primitive forms of calendar system we could imagine by now. However, it has, since its invention, been fictionally mythologized to such an extent that now it is considered a name of God and not a form of calendar. This occultation of right understanding of this system has been accomplished across the span of many eons by occult cults. Many of these cults have included members who have studied Kabbalah, However, the geopolitical deeds accomplished by other members of these same cults cannot be blamed on those members who studied Kabbalah while the others sought to rule the world. Suffice it to say, however, that by the time this ancient calendar was being studied by persecuted Kabbalists during the Inquisition era of the Dark Ages in Europe, in Tibet, this elaborate Tonka painting was created to express the six lokas, or worlds, into which a dead soul may reincarnate. We see the engine of this wheel of six lokas, a system the Buddhists call samsara, meaning suffering. It's comprised of the three base passions, the boar, passive complacency, equivalent to alchemical salt, the snake, slippery deceptiveness, equivalent to alchemical mercury, and the rooster, active annoyance, equivalent to alchemical sulfur. Around this engine of the wheel of six lokas, or of samsara, we see the philosopher sages ascending clockwise on the left, and the tortured fools falling clockwise on the right. Beyond this are the six lokas, or realms inhabited by the different types of bodies into which we can choose to reincarnate. Like a roulette wheel is by luck, the spinning of the wheel of samsara stops for us on the world chosen for us by our karma, meaning labor, as in works or deeds. The six loka worlds of suffering are the animal, the philosopher, the sage, the fool, the lost soul, and the devil. The Buddha sees this all from above, including his own reflection in it, alike a pond of water, and as his reflection ripples in the waves of all living karma, it assumes the visage of Vajra, the wrathful male Kali. Although it depicts the six lokas of samsara, this image should not be thought of in the same sense as the Western business calendar. The calendars employed in the Western business world are used to measure time on a day-to-day -day basis for scheduling when events will occur and for remembering when to change the clocks and when to celebrate what holidays. This system is entirely different from the one being shown us here in this Tibetan Tonka, and yet, because this Tonka is showing us effectively a mirror of all existence, it must also be able to be thought of as simulating a form of calendar. Insofar as it indicates the influence of karma as change to one's environment, brought about by one's own will, also the Western definition of magic, the six loka wheel of samsara does at least obliquely imply the presence in the model of the measurement of entropic change as time. Once we begin to see, through the looking glass, of our own ego's interpretation of this model, and to begin to see it as a calendar also, we will notice its six lokas divide a circle of 360 degrees into six even angles of 60 degrees each. The significance of this, that it divides a circle into six equilangular triangles of 60 degrees, will become clear once we begin to pursue the origins 
of the calendar of 360 days. Here we see the calendar as it was conceived of originally by our most ancient Homo sapien ancestors who dwelt in caves near Neanderthals and came to cross-culturally exchange customs with them. The Neanderthals apparently learned to bury their dead from early Homo sapiens. According to the legends from the beginnings of all the greatest empires of civilization in our current era of historical records, their ancestors before the deluge had met alien gods who had given early primitive mankind all the rudimentary implements of civilization, from making beads to smelting metal, from planting seeds to beating swords into plowshares. This calendar, the first of any kind of such, is attributed by myths at least as old as the times of King Solomon to the Genesis patriarch Enoch. Enoch was a descendant of Seth and Cain, who was taken off in a dream by an angelic guide and shown a prophetic vision. One aspect of Enoch's dream was a detailed description of a calendar with 364 days. This differs from the calendar we know to be accurate today, that of 365 and one-fourth day long years. However, the calendar of Enoch was strictly specific in detailing this calendar of 364 days as being the original basis for the modern calendar of 365 and a quarter. We see here how the original Enochian calendar could be used to convert easily between the standard year of 365 days and the original calendar of only 360. The 360-day calendar divides into four seasons of 90 days each, which in turn each divide into three months of 30 days each for a total of 12 months and 360 days. At the end of each season, a holiday is added, bringing the sum to the Enochian 364. Then, to bring the sum up to our own modern level of understanding, we add an annual holiday, 365. However, it was not originally the intention of the author of the Book of Enoch's description of the calendar to see it split apart like that. Instead, the author proposed a model split apart into three seasonal sections of 91 days each. Instead of splitting the year into four seasonal parts as we have now with spring, summer, autumn, and winter, the Enochian system describes a world defined by only three main seasons for their entire year. It was only later that this system was divided up into four parts as we have now. It is possible it was divided into four because of the 25 angels called Anunnaki, meaning watchers, in the book of Enoch, who fell and became the accursed Nephilim of Genesis or Gregory of later Enochian. These 25 fallen watchers, less by one, Sabaoth, who it was said repented, were described in vivid detail in the Book of Enoch. 24 fallen watchers can be placed around the calendar as two weeks of 15 days each per each month of 30 days per each season of 90 days per each year of 360, of 364, or of 365. In the original version, the calendar was divided into three parts of 91 days each. The original number of Anunnaki watchers was given as seven who watch corresponding to the seven sisters of the Pleiades constellation, whose names were Uriel, 
Raphael, Raguel, Michael, Sarakiel, Gabriel, and Remael. There were also seven angels, according to the book of Enoch, who bred with the wives of men, the so-called Nephilim. There were also seven alchemical mountains that covered the area between where Enoch lived and the gateway to Eden, the entrance to paradise. There were, in addition, a total of 21 fallen angels listed in the Book of Enoch. Because the angels described in the Book of Enoch are all arranged in groups divisible by seven, and because the value of seven is the sum of three plus four, we may begin to see how the four-season calendar can be translated into the three-season calendar using the seven angels from the book of Enoch as a guide. However, to best understand the meaning of the Enochian calendar, let us study the three main systems of calendars that arose immediately after the mythological global flood. First among these to arise in most detail was the Vedic calendar, as shown here around the larger outer ring for comparison with the common 12-month annular zodiac around the smaller interior ring. The Vedic calendar does not measure the Babylonian zodiac as it would read in the usual direction of months in a year. It reads them in the direction opposite this according to their use as a measure for the solar aeons of polar precession. The Vedic calendar is divided up into eight essential parts, split in half between them by a vertical axis, defining the left side of the circle as ascending and the right side as descending. The names of the eras or epochs are the same on both opposite sides of this vertical axis and are reflected symmetrically across from one another by it. These are, clockwise from the top, the Sattva Yuga, the Treta Yuga, the Dwarpa Yuga, and the Kali Yuga. The term Yuga relates not only to an extremely long duration of time, as demarcated on the Vedic calendar, but relates to five of the six sides of a dice. Supposedly, a dice is thrown by Krishna in a game played in his dream. There are five sides on the dice he can roll that will continue his dream, but if he rolls the sixth side of the dice, he will wake up. These five sides of the dice in Krishna's dream which is the perpetual recreation of our own cosmos, are the five yugas, the golden sattva, the bronze treta, the copper dwarpa, and the most unlucky role, the kali yuga, signifying an epoch of great destruction. It is said that if Krishna rolls the sixth side of the dice in his dream, then his dream will end and he will awaken, and our cosmos will cease to exist. It is this ceasing to exist in a single instant, and then flashing back into an entirely new reality in the next moment to follow, that causes the symmetrical mirroring effect along the vertical axis. The Sattva Yuga, or Golden Age, lasts the longest, beginning on a western clock at about 9.30, and continuing around clockwise until about 2.30. On the calendar, this era lasts from 16,302 to 3,602 B.C., a total of 12,700 years. It experiences a period of ascent first, followed by a period of descent. Its peak ascent occurred in 11,502 B.C. This peak ascent's pivotal nadir point is the middle of the Kali Yuga. Following the Satya Yuga, during a descending epoch, and following the Dvarpa epoch, during the era of ascent, 
is the Treta Yuga, meaning the bronze role. The third role is seen as less lucky than the first role, the role of gold, but as more lucky than the second role, the role of copper, the Dvapara. The Kali Yuga, or worst role, is seen as the most unlucky of them all and closest to being the sixth roll of the dice that would blink us all out of existence forever. The sixth-sided roll is signified by a date on this calendar system that corresponds to the year 498 A.D. The Vedic calendar is very old, very basic, and on the surface seems acceptable enough. However, remember that the calibration of the Vedic calendar relevant to the placement of the Babylonian zodiac of the usual aeons is not precise, nor necessarily accurate. Thus, though the calendrical system works as such, its dates relative to those on a modern calendar cannot be exactly accurately fixed. Thus, most importantly, the Vedic calendar is flexible. Its spans of duration can be moved around arbitrarily, but the basic number of them, and their relationships to one another, is never changing. There are as many as eight possible yugas that can be mapped onto the Vedic calendar, and these can be counted by as few as four kinds. These golden, bronze, copper, and silver ages were known to the earliest sages of China contemporary to the later Vedic era in India. By recombining the broken and unbroken Tao lines, symbolizing the basic yes or no options of the Chinese Zen yin yang concept, three times each, one arrives at the eight Chinese I Ching trigrams. These are seen here, emanating inward toward the yin-yang logo at the center from their names in the surrounding octagon. Red clockwise around from the upper right corner they proceed Kun, Earth, Tui, Lake, Chayan, Heaven, Khan, Water, Ken, Mountain, Chen, Thunder, Shun, Wind, and Li, Fire. The attributions of the trigrams to elements, mountain equals earth, wind equals heaven, lake equals water, thunder equals fire, gives us a visual cue for describing them. But in reality, all we are seeing here is a collection of 8 times 3 equals 24 Tao lines. These Tao lines are repeated as letters in many alphabets, the 24 Elder Futhark runes being the most similar, and derived in essentially the same way. However, these 24 Tao lines, comprising 8 trigrams, symbolizing the doubling of 4 elements, are only the simplest form of the I Ching, which is a system devised for calendrical interpretation of the elements, and which is used now for divination. When the two states of Yin or Yang Tao lines are multiplied by three, they form two regular configurations, Heaven and Earth, which remain unchanging throughout, and six other irregular configurations, called the trigrams of three dualistic Tao lines each. These are the eight trigrams of I Ching. If you take these eight trigrams and double each with itself, such that there is one trigram above and the other trigram below, you will have constructed the eight double hexagrams of I Ching. The eight hexagram doubles of these original eight prime trigrams represent the eight variations of fixed or relatively unchanging traits between the total set of eight possible trigrams and the total set of 64 possible hexagrams. 
Thus, 2 in 8 are fixed, and so are 8 in 64. The 64 hexagrams, formed by squaring the 8 trigrams, combining each per row with all the others per file, as above, so below, can themselves be arranged in a virtually infinite number of different ways. They are shown here in what is known as the King Wen sequence, named for the man who found it. The King Wen can yield a particular pattern of internal correspondence by comparing the first order of difference from one hexagram to the next in sequence. By plotting the changes in first order of difference between each hexagram, a graph can be arranged. This graph is what Terence and Dennis McKenna who discovered it, named Time Wave Zero, because it seemed to them to be counting down. To describe this interpretation, the McKenna brothers coined the term decreasing novelty. As the King Wen sequence progresses, the amount of novelty of the first order of difference decreases toward none. The 64 hexagrams are, as I mentioned, used today for divination for the very reason that, as the McKenna brothers discovered, as all possible combinations begin to be exhausted, as all recombinations have been tried, and as the remaining sum of untested models nears zero, and as the project approaches completion, the rate at which metastasis occurs accelerates asymptotically. Whether the King Wen sequence can be empirically tested and determined if it is the top of such a figurative hyperbolic curve as the last possible recombination of all possible combinations depends on which combination one would use to start such a long sequence. The most important aspect of this line of reasoning is often overlooked by those studying it. The I Ching serves as a calendar because the 64 possible hexagrams are comprised of a total of 384 Tao lines, and there are exactly 384 nights in a 13-month lunar cycle. The lunar calendar records the real number of full moons per solar year and differs from the fixed number of days in the standard solar orbit-based calendar. While in China, the sages were arranging the apparently limitless recombinations of the 64 I Ching hexagrams, they were in Vedic India, writing in a language called Sanskrit. Sanskrit is an oriental phonetic alphabet and evolved from Proto-Ganges script in much the same way and at around the same time as Egyptian hieroglyphics appear to have evolved from Ugaritic Linear A. However, unlike the seemingly limitless vocabulary of languages based on ideographic letters such as Ancient Egyptian or Modern Chinese, Sanskrit has a fixed number of possible letters based on a limited range of audible sounds produced in a combination of pronunciations. The Sanskrit alphabet has 50 letters. Sanskrit is not directly relevant to the number of King Wen sequence I Ching hexagrams on the surface, since the number of the first order of difference between them would be 64 minus 50 equals 14, which is only twice 7, the number symbolizing the planets and chakras. However, if the eight double hexagrams are taken as literally meant to be expressed twice, and the sum of 64 hexagrams is increased from 64 to 72, then the number of Sanskrit letters being 50, which is in turn 22 less than 72, becomes somewhat more relevant. At the same time the most ancient Vedic myths and fables were being recorded in Sanskrit in India, across the Hindu Kush mountain range southwest of the Himalayas, in the fertile crescent region of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers valley, nowadays the arid deserts called Iraq. Their alphabet was cuneiform, 
a partially phonetic, partially ideographic dialect of a variant total number of letters. But the 50 Sanskrit letters of the Indus River Valley were venerated instead as the 50 names of Marduk in the Babylonian pre-Hebrew Genesis in Numa Elish. These 50 names of Marduk were, originally, the names of 50 Anunnaki, watchers, who, according to the older Sumerian myths, were aliens from another planet. Regardless of the origins of the Anunnaki of Sumeria, the 50 names in the Enuma Elish are a comparable concept from ancient Mesopotamia to the 50 Sanskrit letters. The Sumerian Anunnaki may have been as few as 50 or any number more, however Marduk was only one. The original monotheist faith was not the solar worship instituted by Amenhotep IV when he built Karnak and was renamed Akhenaten. It was, and remains to this day, the worship of Marduk, the monotheist patron deity of Babylon. Marduk is the god whom the Old Testament is based on. Marduk is the devil, Satan, worshipped as Moloch at Bohemian Grove. Marduk is Krishna, appearing to Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra in his many-armed form, saying, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Marduk is Apuk of the Mayan Popol Vuh and related codices. Marduk was the archetypal great burner in his role in Babylonian myth as the bringer of the hot winds that killed off all the gods after the flood, just after the erection of the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the tongues at the time of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah when Abraham fled the lands of Ur and entered the lands of Egypt. The significance of Marduk's 50 names is, once again, related to the 50 letters of the Sanskrit alphabet. When you combine the 50 letters of Sanskrit in the form of the 50 names of Marduk with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the result is the 72-letter Shemham Farash. Here we see the arrangement of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet called the 231 Gates of Benah. Each of the 231 gates is symbolized here by a line connecting one letter to another. Each letter is connected to all 22 others by a single line or gate, and thus there are 231 lines or gates connecting all 22 letters when they are arranged in a circle as such. In this arrangement, as in the next, we begin at the position of the uppermost left with Aleph, and proceed counterclockwise toward Beth, and then proceed around counterclockwise until we read Tao on the uppermost right. In this arrangement of the 231 gates diagram for the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, we do not see them as Hebrew letters at all, but rather as their shorthand notation symbols representing the three alchemical elements, the seven Olympic planets, and the twelve Babylonian zodiac signs. We begin with Aleph equals air, and proceed around counterclockwise to Beth equals moon, and so forth until we come to Tao equals Jupiter. The attribution of what traits to which letters, and vice versa, has been a matter of long debate among literary Kabbalists, and appears to remain more or less arbitrary. The overall number is important, wherein there are 22 Hebrew letters only because there are 22 attributes symbolized by the three elements, seven planets and twelve zodiac signs, just as there are twelve consonants and seven vowels in Greek for the same reason. All arrangements of these symbols on such a circle obeying the format of the 231 gates of Benah will eventually repeat patterns that can also occur as star charts in astrology. The Dendara Zodiac of the Osiris Hathor Temple of Ancient Egypt is the oldest known structure depicting the constellations of the northern night sky. With almost no alterations, 
The same chart is used to this day in astrology. We see Aries in the upper right, proceeding counterclockwise around to Taurus in the upper left, and so forth. There are three figures in the middle that do not appear to reflect the traditional characteristics of the tropical zodiac's originally Babylonian signs. These symbolize the Big Dipper as an ox leg, Draco as Sobek, and Vega as a small fox. Also around the outer edge, outside of the circle formed from the signs of the tropical zodiac, are 36 deacons, each symbolizing one week of 10 days in a 360-day solar calendar with five holidays used as the Egyptian civic calendar during the Old and Middle Kingdoms. The 36 deacons of the Egyptian solar civic calendar represent an idea almost identical to the 50 names of Marduk. They are thought to be at once anthropic, deities, and measures of time on a calendar. It is for this very good reason we say the earliest authentically Hebrew Hakabalists were schooled on metaphysics in Egypt. All of Egyptian religion in the form of worship as deified, the ideograms of their liturgical literature, was entirely based on study of the anthropomorphic expression as combined homozoomorphs of complex, advanced levels of metaphysical thought. To analyze the role in their cosmology of each Egyptian god would take much longer than I have time for here. Suffice it to say that these 36 Egyptian deacons are the key to fully unlocking the meaning of the 72-letter Shimham Farash as one-fifth, called a jubilee, of a 360-day calendar model. The next step in the history of the 360-day calendar model came when the Habaru-speaking Hyksos, shepherd kings of Lower Egypt, followed Akhenaten and his brother Tutmosis, calling themselves Moses and Aaron, into exile out of Egypt and into the wastelands of the Sinai Peninsula in an event the Bible records as the Exodus. One particular aspect of great interest to literary Kabbalists from the book of Exodus describing these events was the description of Moses calling upon God to part the Red Sea. The magical incantation deriving from this account forms 72 angel names of three letters length each, when the three sentences of 72 letters each are read as rows along columns rather than as columns along rows. The total sum of all the letters in this passage combined forms the Shemham Farash of 216 letters. 216 is three-fifths of 360. Likewise, 72 times 2 equals 144, which is a Fibonacci number, or a number that occurs in the set of additive sums where each integer is the sum of the digits of the two prior integers to it on the list. Beginning with 1 plus 1 equals 2, where 1 plus 2 equals 3, 2 plus 3 equals 5, 3 plus 5 equals 8, and so forth, on up to the twelfth iteration of 89 plus 55 equals 144. When plotted onto a Cartesian coordinate graphing chart, these Fibonacci numbers will naturally occur on points forming a golden ratio spiral. Here we see the second group of 72, derived from the 216-letter Exodus verse Shemham Farash, known as the Goetic Shemham Farash, referring to a practice of black magic forbidden by monotheism. Just as the Shemham Farash itself was considered angelic, so was its counterpart, the Goetic Shemham Farash, considered demonic. The demonic Gosha version of the Shemham Farash provides sigils or mason's marks for each of the 72 demons it signifies. 
These were believed to have been the original builders' insignias emblazoned on the bricks each laid while they were enlisted by King Solomon to help build the first temple to God. The Goetic sigils were either used later or invented and backdated from during the Middle Dark Ages, toward the end of the Inquisition and the dawning of the Age of Enlightenment. They were used in ritual evocation or a magical ceremony involving the physical activity of the magician in order to summon a tangible manifestation of one of the goetic demons. This was accomplished by a magus standing inside a so-called magic circle and conjuring or gesturing with a wand to accentuate and stir up chaos energy toward the accomplishment of their will. According to the Middle Dark Age grimoires, some of which were translated by S. L. McGregor Mathers, there were two keys to unlocking the mystery of the Shamham Farash of 216 letters from the Exodus verse. One was the greater key of King Solomon, a system based on assigning 36 talismans among the seven planets, and the other, the lesser key, the Goetia of King Solomon, assigning 72 names of demons to the work on the Temple of Solomon. The difference between the lesser and greater keys of Solomon the King is accentuated and expanded upon by comparing the mythology regarding demons being the builders of Solomon's Temple to the craft of free and accepted speculative masonry. Blue Lodge Freemasonry's primary myth is of the building of Solomon's Temple. It's designed by Hiram Abiff, a Tyrian, and his betrayal and murder by three construction workers. Does this mean that these three traitorous killers were actually from among the 72 names of demons in the Goetia? Here we see the secret seal of Solomon from the Goetia or Lesser Key. The anagram around the edge of the seal is an acronym. The notericon of this phrase is understanding of one of the Freemasonic lost words. The anagram around the outside of the secret seal of Solomon depicts sigils or automatic writing signatures in an alienated cursive script-like form. However, to one familiar with this topic from the Masonic point of view, who would know where to look for a comparison between traits in the Dark Age grimoires about the Goetia and use of demons as workers on Solomon's Temple on the one hand, and on the other hand the secret society which was formed around the same time as the Dark Age grimoires were forged, e.g. F and A M, the similarity to the Royal Arch Capstone, the stone the builders rejected, is obvious. So this is often the first place of conjunction many Masons come into the study of all this material through, rather like fitting an elephant through a pinhole. In this 17th century wood carving, we see a scene depicting Solomon using a magic ring of power to control a host of demons, including among who is, we are told, Baalzebul, the Lord of the Flies, whose title is Baal, in whose name is Zebub. Baal Zebub was a predecessor to the demon Belial, written of by the Essenes of Qumran in the War Scroll as the father of all lies, and who was called by the era of the Dark Age grimoire's composition Belier. Likewise, Lucifer to the early Christians had become Lucifugrovacal by the time of the grimoires. Solomon was, even according to the biblical accounts, not a strict adherent of monotheism. It may be possible he believed that by hiring a force of 72 work overseers for a larger number of crews, he was honoring the monotheist god of Moses, emulating the 72 Shimham Farash in his Goetia. However, to the stricter monotheist priest class of Solomon's era, Solomon's methods were heretical, and so they accused him of worshipping demons, specifically the fallen angels from the era of the Book of Enoch, which had, by the era of Solomon, become known as demons. Later still, as recently as the 20th century AD, 
There has been a strong resurgence of occult interest in this entire line of reasoning that has occurred due largely to the Golden Dawn members' releasing of their translations or interpretations of the Dark Ages grimoires. In this diagram from S. L. McGregor Mathers and Aleister Crowley's 20th century of the Gothia, we see the triangle of conjuring into which the gesturing Magus would seek to visualize his desired demon into being, and the magic circle of the magician's craft inside which the Magus stood to protect themselves from any adverse effects of their sorcery occurring in their surrounding environment. The angelic names of the Exodus verse Shemhamfarash appear on the coiled serpent symbolizing the Magus's magic circle. Such is the current condition in which we find the most prevalent knowledge about the Shemhamfarash, name of God, based on the 360 solus per annum calendar of prehistoric mankind. In this colorized version of the same diagram, we see even more clearly that the blue hexagrams inside the circle are meant to keep the energy from outside out, and that the red pentagrams outside the circle are meant to keep the energy from the inside in. The hexagram is the symbol of the macrocosm, and the pentagram of the microcosm. Thus, because this ritual, and all related forms of conjuring, constitutes the practice of black magic, and thus is accredited first to the grimoires of King Solomon, and because of the injunction against the practice of any form of ritual black magic, all forms of such evocation are prescribed by the monotheist deity from the book of Leviticus onward, and remain so today. However, deeply buried beneath this moral morass of reasons not to practice magic is the truth about this system originally representing a prehistoric calendar. The trick to reading the Goetic Shemhamfarash as a calendar is to read it as upon the back of the coiled serpent. Thus, this form of the calendar model coils, or rather, spirals. The trick is to read it like one would read the Rose Cross Layman, which has three layers of petals, the outermost of twelve, the middle of seven, and the innermost of three. When one constructs a sigil pattern by using the Rose Cross Layman as a template, one takes each letter of the name and finds its location among the twenty-two Hebrew letters marking the petals of the Rose Cross Layman, then connects the dots in sequence. The resulting vector pathway appears flat, but could also be seen as occupying depth in a third dimension by considering the rose cross layman itself as if it were, like a real rose, comprised of three layers of petals, each layer of different depth. The entire point of creating sigils, however, is to summon universal energy to assume strength for your own will over natural elemental forces by forging their seal to summon it. Because the thorns of this rose are poisonously fatal, sigil magic is prescribed in Leviticus. However, the Golden Dawn restarted the open practice of it by distributing and explaining the Rose Cross Layman. Just as the Rose Cross Layman symbolizes the rotation of the three top petals, the three alchemical elements, the seven middle petals, the seven planets, the twelve lowest petals, the twelve zodiac signs, of multiple levels, all operating independently of one another. So too does the same method apply to deciphering this model, which has long baffled Mesoamerican anthropologists in its normal flat form, the Aztec calendar stone. The Aztec stone is meant to imply the depth of a round conical tower seen from above. In the middle is the large face of Tezcatlipoca, the fifth sun. Surrounding him are the smaller faces of the four other world suns or Aztec eons. One step lower down from this level we find the ring of twenty day names, Aztec months. One step below these are eight dividing arrows, and beyond them in the outer ring are twelve glyphs hidden as scales on twin snakes, 
with human faces wrapped around upward from the bottom on either side, with the thirteenth symbol being shared by both to total the thirteen day names of Aztec weeks. The method of reading the Aztec calendar stone is to think of it as looking down on an upright tower. The myth regarding the Tower of Babel is that it was built by mankind because they wanted to make a name for themselves and to become like unto the god of contemporary monotheism, i.e. Marduk. This only aroused their god's displeasure, and the result of their attempt to please him by emulation of him was the confusion of the tongues, whereby all the various different regionally evolved languages spoken today were first given to mankind, and we were all made to speak in them. This is significant because it puts the date of the first alphabets around the time of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah following the global flood prior to Abraham's leaving Ur and entering Egypt. This is contemporary, historically speaking, to the era of the end of the Sumero-Akkadian Golden Age and the beginning of the Babylonian Empire. Thus, the Tower of Babel has come to symbolize God's wrath at mankind's hubris. To Ganesh, the avatar of Brahma, the creator. To Vishnu, the preserver, who was Buddha, who was Krishna, who will be Maitreya. To Shiva, the destroyer, and her manifestation as the Yuga of Kali. To the religion of the Hebrews, the Reform, Orthodox, and Hasidic. To the religion of all Christendom, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant. To the religion of Islam, the Sevener Ishmaeli, the Twelver Shiites, and the Sunni. Let the tower symbolize a warning of fate's dissatisfaction with greed. And remember the symbol of the New World Order is the eye in the triangle printed on money. Religious Metaphysics Part 2 In Reality Part 1 Modern Science Part 1a Personal Electromagnetism The soul is known as the spark of life in the West and as chi energy in the East. It is called the Ruach, breath of life, in Hebrew, the Ba, energy shadow, in ancient Egyptian, and the Aura, vehicle or Vimana, in Vedic India. The soul is, in Buddhism, the Tao of Zen, or way of nothingness. The soul is what buffers external stimuli by narrowing the focus of our ordinarily infinite perception. The soul is like the outer wall of a biological cell of which our mind is the nucleus. Our soul is like an electron in an orbital energy level cloud, and our mind is like the quarks bound by gluons in the atomic nucleus. The soul is a biologically built electromagnetic cyclotron. The soul is a stable wormhole, inside of which we are just a brain on a shelf. Here we see the pattern formed by a single vector on the surface of a four sphere or tube torus when seen from above its poles. This was long believed to be the shape of the soul, though invisible to most, that surrounds every living being with an aura. This pattern arises from a magnetic dipole effect. A magnet was once thought to only be a piece of metallic iron ore that would always point in the same direction when set into a puddle of water. Now it is known that the magnetic effect is co-joined to the electromagnetic spectrum of radiation, such that a strong enough magnetic field, such as at the poles of a planet, can bend light, causing auroras. The concept of a magnetic dipole is simple. It has a positive end that attracts to the nearest, strongest negative source of magnetism. 
This is marked as pointing north in the diagram. The opposite side from this is magnetically negative, meaning it repels from other similar negative poles. This is marked as pointing south in the diagram. This diagram shows small filings of metallic iron ore as they appear under the influence of a dipolar magnet. This shape also depicts the cross-section of a tube torus. The Earth itself has a soul. By the criteria of a soul being a toroidal electromagnetic field generated around a living being by their cells forming an electrically charged magnetic dipole, then the Earth fits this definition if we consider that we are the living cells who comprise the unique patterns inside the electromagnetic field of the planet Earth. The Earth exerts a magnetic pull on the positive end of a smaller magnet toward the south pole now because the south pole of planet Earth exerts a positive field of ions. These ions arc outward and around the Earth in an electromagnetic torus to return to the Earth's north polar regions in a greatly diminished sum. Because the ions of the current North Pole fail to ionize the water there, it does not desalinate and can thus not form into the massive ice sheets of glaciers. The occasional reversal of the Earth's electromagnetic polarity corresponds to the great North-South, North-South cycling of ice ages. In the same way Earth experiences its seasons due to the 23.5 degree tilt of its inclination from its orbital ecliptic plane, it experiences its magnetic pole reversals due to the gradual recombination of locations of the geographic and magnetic poles until at the apex of the sunspot cycle they exactly overlap and this event begins the magnetic pole reversal process which moves the magnetic pole away from the geographic pole at an even more rapid rate than it had approached it before they recombined. This same offsetting of the physical and invisible force field poles occurs in the orders of each and every person and forms the differences between us that make each of our souls unique. The soul is an emanation originating within the chakras, and because the chakras can be associated with the seven-color spectrum, we would expect to see the aura reflecting the influence on it of each of the chakras by appearing to emanate in its correspondent hue in the seven-color spectrum. This has been the case in all art that depicts the chakras and their invisible field of personal electromagnetism. From the modern works such as this airbrushing of a mind ascending the confines of the soul surrounding the body by achieving satori, the trance of samadhi or nirvana, in which one knows all, becomes all, and is all. This is embodied in the ancient Vedic expression, Satchit Ananda, meaning essentially truth, consciousness, and bliss. In this tanka of Siddhartha, we see the Buddha expressed as the four elements permeated within, between and across them by the seven chakras, as a central double spiral. This is the Buddha achieving Krishna consciousness, or oneness with the divine cosmic mind of the all. Because the Buddha achieved oneness with the divine cosmic mind of the all, he was said to be an avatar or lesser material physical incarnation of Vishnu, and thus also all the subsequent Dalai Lamas are believed by Tibetan Buddhists to be avatars or later reincarnations of the Buddha. As we have seen, the twelve Chinese meridians and the seven Vedic chakras have proven to be legitimate neurons in ganglia and plexi, forming the central and peripheral nervous systems. Thus, it also stands to reason that, in spite of modern Western medicine considering it parapsychology, implying a self-induced delusion, the electrical charge of the nervous system can generate a magnetic dipole field that surrounds the body of a living being. However, can science further prove the soul can leave the body at the time of the body's death? 
Let us delve deeper into these so-called mysteries of religious metaphysics. We can see in this diagram from Western medicine how five nerve centers comprise the autonomic or unconsciously functioning nervous system, which controls the functions of our organs without our needing to think about them to make them work. The lowest controls the gonads, bladder, kidney, and rectum. The second up controls the large and small intestines, adrenal gland, pancreas, liver, the abdominal blood vessels, and the stomach. The third controls the heart and lungs. The fourth controls the tear gland, nose palate, submaxillary and sublingual glands, and the mouth salivary gland. The fifth controls the eyes. These are almost identical to the ancient charts showing the seven chakras. The chakras, however, are indeed real nerve centers. The difference between the seven chakras and the five centers of the autonomic nervous system are that the chakras count the solar plexus as part of the same nerve system as the sacral plexus, and the five centers of the autonomic nervous system do not include the crown chakra, symbolic of the entire cerebral cortex. The seven chakra are, thus, in ascending order, Muladhara, the coccygeal plexus, Svadhisthana, the sacral plexus, Manipura, the solar plexus, Anahata, the pulmonary and cardiac plexi, Vishuddhi, the pharyngeal plexus, the Ajna, the carotid plexus, and Sahasrara, the cerebral cortex. In this chart from Western medicine, we see the twelve Chinese meridians can be thought to correspond with these twelve functions over different motor control in various parts of the lower brain. We see the sensory fibers, or read-only neurons, are colored in red, and the motor fibers, or write-only neurons, are colored in blue. Each portion of the underside of the brain serves to control one cluster of motor fiber neurons and responds to only sensations from that specific cluster of neurons. In considering this model, we should also consider the nature of the bicameral brain. The cerebral cortex, the gray matter tissue of our brain's outermost, thickest layer, is divided dorsally in two hemispheres, a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere. The right hemisphere of the brain is responsible for sensory and motor activity in the left side of the body, and the left hemisphere of the brain is responsible for sensory and motor activity in the right side of the body. They are reversed as they pass through the hypothalamus, which serves as the primary conduit between the uppermost brain stem of the spine and the lowermost cortices and glands of the cerebrum. The brain is here labeled as the seat of no less than 12 senses, However, we will break these down into the general five categories of sight, the anterior cortex and hindbrain, sound, the fissures corresponding on either side to a spot above the ears, smell, below the forebrain's frontal cortex tissues, speech, in fissures on either side just in front of the ear fissures, sense, combining motor control and touch and pressure centers around the topmost area of the cerebrum, and taste, fissures paired on either side just above the hearing sensory fissures. Confirming the long-held belief in the brain being the seat of the soul, there are also fissures in the aft quarter of both hemispheres that relate to the arts of communication, gestural, language, and reading skills. The ancients perceived the pineal gland as central to the brain, just as they perceived Earth to be the core of the infinite cosmos. Were they wrong to do so? Now that we have the X-ray and EEG imaging technology capable of peering into every little corner, nook, and cranny of the cerebellum, 
and we have not found one single cell responsible solely for the role of self-aware consciousness, i.e. a soul, perhaps it is time to look elsewhere and outside of only the basic brain for such an energy. With x-rays we can depict the brain, but only with sonic frequencies can we seek to heal brain tumors without using any invasive surgical procedure. Likewise, we can depict using Corellian photography the energy field that surrounds all objects, such as that emanating from this nautilus shell, which lingers in the object long after the life inside it has departed. In the case of this nautilus shell, the mollusk that usually inhabits it is gone, yet the shell itself glows with bolts of blue, pink, and white light. If this energy field shown in Corellian photography is, indeed, the substance of the soul as an aura surrounding a living being, then it indicates the soul does not leave the body at the time of death, but stays with it until it is entirely deteriorated to the point it can no longer radiate thermal energy or emit radioactive carbon element 14. Even more significant than that finding, if indeed it does apply to the soul, is the discovery via Corellian photography that non-living matter can have a soul, too. Modern Science, Part 1b, The Corellian Aura Using a device called a Corellian photography machine, we can photograph the aura. The device uses a flat metal plate with a camera underneath it. When an object is placed on the plate and a low level of electrical current is run through the metal, a photograph taken through the metal plate of the underside of the object placed on top of it will also show the small electrical charge casting bolts across field lines as the current in the metal plate is transducted into the object set on top of it. Some would contest that, because it is being amplified by the charged plate, the energy captured in the photograph is not native to the object being depicted. However, the introduction of electricity into an object will still react in only one of two ways. One way, sparks, for a living object, and another, glows, for an inanimate object. Also, the color scale established between them, with blue sparks depicting for a living object, and a red glow emanating evenly for a dead or inanimate object, is unique to Corellian photos. Long exposure Corellian photographs, such as this one of an apple, can show the amount of life an object has in it, as the high end of the blue end of the lifeline color spectrum of Corellian photos fades to a bright white light the longer the exposure time. Long exposures of living objects can, however, be confused for high amplitude short exposure photos of non-living objects because in both there is a high voltage of white light depicted. However, as we see in this Curlian photo of a half an apple, a long exposure of a living object shows the white shifting of the blue sparks, while the white light in any duration of exposure time of a dead object will only depict the amplitude of the electrical current being passed through it. The aura of living objects depicted in Curlian photos is a combination of the current being passed through the metal plate and the natural electrical charge of the living object. The result, as we see here in this depiction of a pair of human hands, shows up in Curlian photos as a halo of blue sparks formed between the living object and the metal plate. Where the hands are pressed against the plate, these blue sparks appear to form halos, or an aura the light of which actually illuminates the rest of the hands, which are not touching the metal plate, but which are still visible in this photo. The white light of these blue sparks distinguishes a living object from the darkness or red glow of an inanimate object. The dark red glow of a dead object should not be confused with the pale light of the blue sparks that can reflect from the surface of the metal plate to illuminate the rest of the living object in a Corellian photograph. As the medium length, medium amplitude depiction of a leaf on the left shows, 
The life force is leaving the dying leaf. The edges are surrounded by a halo of blue sparks, while the interior of the leaves has begun to shift toward a dark red glow. In the Karelian photo of a metal key on the right, we see it emits no light from within it, and instead is just a shadow profiled by the purple glowing white sparks of the electricity sent through it by the metal plate. In these low amplitude, long exposure Karelian photos of a key, a leaf, a starfish, and a coin, we see the different forms of aura or energy field each emits. The key glows a dark red, the living leaf is silhouetted by a dark blue halo, the starfish's spines emit the same effect as the leaf, a halo of blue sparks, while the coin emits a pale red glow uniformly from its flat surface. Because in Karelian photos, both living and non-living objects appear to emit an electrical aura indicative of what has been implied as a soul, it is important to understand the distinct differences in traits of these auras to be able to, by looking at a Karelian photo of any object, determine if the object was alive or dead when the photo was taken. As mentioned before, a low amp, long exposure of the soul of a living object can appear similar to the high amp, short exposure of the soul of a dead object. Consider this high amp, short exposure Karelian photo of a Celtic cross. As one runs a high voltage of electrical current through an inanimate object, it does appear to take on the same essential characteristic traits as exhibited by a low voltage applied over a longer duration to a living object. Their similarities are only illusory, however, in light of the fact that metal, despite magnetic shadowing, does not retain enough semblance of an electrical charge after the current applied to it is removed for it to be considered an animate, self-electrifying object. It is this self-electrification, defining living as opposed to inanimate objects, that is shown in Karelian photos. Second form of photography, making use of the same essential method of technology as the Karelian metal plate designs, but measuring only the electrical transduction between five small metal circles and the tips of a person's fingers, shows us more minute differences in the aggregate charge of sparks exchanged between the fingertips and the charged metal as differences along the seven color spectrum reflecting, essentially, our mood at the time of the photo. We see here the simulated colors of her fingertips, amplified charges, shown projected onto an image of the person taking the picture, thus effectively depicting the aura of the person. The usual interpretation of the seven chakras attribution to the seven color spectrum applies in the interpretation of the colors simulated in these photos. If the electrical charge emitted from the body is strongly positive, the aura appears blue. If the electrical charge emitted from the body is strongly negative, the aura appears red. If the mood of the person is neither sad nor angry, their energy is neutral and appears green. In this form of depiction, our aura can appear as only one color, or as many different colors. The placement of colors in the different areas of our auras depicts the difference in electrical transduction between our different fingertips. There are, thus, five areas of the aura, each area of which can be one of seven colors. When these five areas are all the same color, it signifies the alignment of the chakras, or that there is harmony of the same mood throughout the whole organism. When these five areas are not all one color, but each one different, it signifies the disalignment of the chakras, such that a being is restless or dissatisfied, or that their feelings at the time of the photo were mixed. Modern Science, Part 1C the Altered Psyche. 
Although pagan shamans have used drugs to induce trance meditative mind states since before the beginning of recorded history, modern civilization opposes their use in favor of artificial methods of inducing correspondent experiences. The field studying the potential of the human psyche for psychic and even psychokinetic power is called parapsychology in modern science. We see here a subject under testing during a Gansfeld experiment, such as those developed by Wolfgang Metzger in the 1930s. The eyes are covered with gauze, or in more modern use, one half each of a ping pong ball, so that the red light projected on them appears as opaque as possible. Also, headphones can be used to play sounds into the subject's ears, usually of white or pink static sounds created from phasing two or more regularly pulsed signals of offset polarities. This experiment, used to test a subject for aptitude at remote viewing, was based on earlier studies done using sensory deprivation. The psychological effects of sensory deprivation are similar to those experienced using natural drugs. In short doses, sensory deprivation is relaxing and conducive to meditative mind states. In long or forced doses, sensory deprivation induces extreme anxiety, hallucinations, bizarre paranoias, and depression. Sensory deprivation is usually performed in a hermetically sealed tank, allowing in no external light, and partially filled with warm water, in which the subject then floats asleep, meant to mimic the conditions of an unborn fetus inside a womb. The effect sensory deprivation was originally designed to test, and which occurs for the mind state of a person during meditation or on natural drugs, is called an out-of-body experience, or astral travel. Although no scientific experiments have been conducted to confirm the validity of such claims as made by shaman from ancient to modern times, by projecting the mind outside the body, and manifesting it into a new body, one can literally be in two places at once. The mind, after leaving the body, can move like a ghost in a lucid dream, passing through objects or moving them, reading minds or possessing them, and knows no confines based on gravity. As this mind state is practiced, the details one can experience will become more vivid and realistic. And as this occurs, it becomes possible to begin to narrow them down to only the most probable scenarios at specific target locations, and thus to remote view. The results of scientific experiments meant to mimic the mind states of shaman can only uncover for us all using artificial machines what is already known to the shaman themselves using drugs. Thus, though we can await the responses from their mechanical tests to verify them, we can predict the results of any form of psi or parapsychology experiment easily enough by relating it to a comparable form of mind state experienced by a shaman on drugs. As the concept of natural shamanism has declined from favor with civilization's technological progress, the ancient shaman, tribal medicine man, has resorted to isolated self-expression of their trance states to feed themselves individually and their social role is now seen as almost entirely in the realm of aesthetics. In this lithograph by Albert Dürer, we see the Angel of Melancholy showing us the usual mind state of such a shaman caged in a civilization that does not value them. In the so-called X-ray style, of psychedelic art by modern shaman Alex Gray, we see the terrible anguish of the artist, shaman, who undergoes the extreme passions of the bipolarity between emotional highs and lows as they are crushed beneath the psychic gravity of their own self-destruction by the cosmic demiurge. Feeling down in the dumps, or 
having the blues seems almost comical from the point of view of someone who is not experiencing it for themselves. However, from the point of view of anyone who has ever suffered what Shakespeare in Hamlet called the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, there is no more painful weight to bear than the desperate emptiness of a broken heart. The breaking point of a subject of parapsychological or MK research comes due to the induction of the same effect called by the depressed person hitting rock bottom. This occurs when external stressors are too strong for the nervous system to handle and it blacks out and restarts itself. Depression is a sticky foe since the more one focuses on it the more enmeshed in it one becomes. Because of this from the point of view of a shaman most people live somewhere between a condition of melancholy and anguish in a state of perpetual depression. However, only those who hit rock bottom can break out above the lowest levels of sorrow to experience any real form of high spirits. The first and most obvious form of escape from sorrow is through sex. Sex, while on psychosomatically experience-enhancing drugs, allows one's mind state to enter a realm that cannot be achieved by an individual while in sensory deprivation. The earliest Tibetan Buddhists classified sex as Tantra, meant to be practiced only by a devout adherent to the Eightfold Path of Dharma. The practice of sex while on a hallucinogen, such as the Soma of the Tibetan Buddhists, is thus meant by the Buddhist shaman to be confined to only those who have undergone prior testing of themselves to determine their motives in pursuing it. This caveat is, however, sadly all too often overlooked by Western cult practitioners. The ultimate result of all forms of meditation, drug-induced, machine-induced, by choice or enforced, etc., for any individual, either alone or conjoined with another, is to see God. There has long been an argument between purist scientists and naturalist shaman over how many gods there are. The purist scientists believe there are two, the true God achieved through prayer and clean living, and the devil who deceives drug users into hallucination in his embrace. Naturalist shaman believe there to be only one, true God, who both they and purists alike must all answer to in the end. While purist scientists struggle to reunify their interior selves with their exteriorized concept of God using artificial, sterile laboratory means, naturalist shaman have long ago dissolved the boundary of their ego between the God within and the God beyond themselves. The naturalist shaman believes all is God. Because all pre-scientific studies of all modern fields of science were once unified under a single concept, metaphysics, and because this concept was studied solely by naturalist shaman until purist science divided from them, it is often associated with mysticism. However, the complex pantheons metaphors for cosmology, of all ancient cultures, especially those which evolved into vast empires, were all originally discovered by mystic shaman, and all reflect symbolically as gods the same forces and interactions nowadays studied solely by purist scientists. In truth, there is only one universe which we all live within and experience, regardless of the belief that drugs delude the mind, and when one focuses their concentration on determining the nature of reality, whether on mind-expanding drugs or using purely scientific instruments, one will always be learning more about its true and real form. The true nature of God is such that the mind or imagination constitutes a superlayer surrounding above and around the outside of reality or the cosmos. When our own mind leaves the confines of its body, or is forced out suddenly, as with a near-death experience, we ascend upward and outward through this superlevel to exit the reality of this cosmos. 
Because some energy is left behind within the body, and because some more energy is left behind in the super level of the soul, and more energy dissipates as we exit this realm and enter heaven beyond, the throne room of God, we experience our mental ascent through these levels as being pulled into a tunnel of light. This tunnel of light is the eye of God, and is comprised of our own soul's energy being burnt off in the form of memories as our rarefied spirit penetrates through the atmosphere of our ego. The concept of a tunnel of light populated by the deceased souls of our dead relatives is as old as the original awakening to self-awareness of mankind's mind. In the biblical accounts we find Jacob's ladder and Ezekiel's wheels within wheels, signifying how Kabbalah is the body of God. In more recent arts, such as this illustration by Gustav Dory for Dante's Paradiso, we see this concept expressed as a light emanating through a cloud of angels. This light, called by Buddhists the primary clear light or Elem, and said by them to have pre-existed the creation of the cosmos, is the greater light of the one spirit, and the cloud of angels surrounding it is the lesser light of the many souls. Because of the difference between being in the presence of the one true God and being in an ordinary condition of consciousness, it is often said by mystics that life is a dream and our death wakes us up. In this sense, our immortal soul acts like a guide for our mortal bodies, and the eternal spirit acts as a guide for our immortal soul. The dualism of a mental guide beside one's own ego is expressed in much mystic art and literature regarding the nature of religious metaphysics. As with Enoch, whose dream guide was named Pinamu, so too with Yeshua ben Padia, whose dream guide was named Panamea, and so too with Dante, whose dream guide was Virgil. Thus, in conceptualizing the mental state of the individual mystic, we see the seven chakras within the meditating shaman, surrounded by their aura or astral acacia. Such is the concept of the individual as God, wherein the mind with no ego is the spirit of all souls, merge into one with the body of the meditating being. This is the trance of Samadhi or Nirvana, experienced when we let go of all stress induced on us by external influences and become an open conduit channeling the flow of cosmic energy forces through us. The mind of a being in such a mental state can control outcomes just as the choice is made by a mind yet deluded by their own ego. However, in Satori, one can control the outcomes even of distant and seemingly unrelated, even unknowable, events. Just as God is the individual, so too is God the plenum. In the vacuum between the many souls exists the One Spirit. Surrounding and beyond the One Spirit are the many souls. Just as the self-mind is particulate, such that each ego is like a particle, so too is the omni-mind a wave field, such that it exists in all locations at once. This void in which the individual floats is itself alive with other individuals. Thus there is no empty space that is not occupied by some form of either matter or energy or combination of both in the entire cosmos. Beyond the cosmos, the mind can yet exist and maintain to travel. However, beyond the real universe and its combination with the multiverse of an imaginary number of parallel realities, the duality between the individual self and the plenum of others ceases to exist. In Reality, Part 2 Further Theories Part 2a Toroidal Tachyonic Thoughts As has been demonstrated, the soul is a torus. It has an exterior aspect called an Akashic Aura and an interior aspect 
The Seven Chakra Twists in the Kundalini Spiral The interior aspect and exterior aspect have the same volume, and thus are one and the same, a single energy field over time, such that they continually exchange places, and as one are a symbol for time, entropy, and the passage of mortal flesh into death and decay. The soul is a hologram around the body like the multiverse of parallel dimensions is to the material cosmos. The effect of both the mind within body, within the soul, and the cosmos inside the multiverse, inside the mind of God, both being holographic hyperspheres independently, is that together they combine to form the manifold scale levels of the cosmos such that all are interchangeable. This means that all levels connect directly without having to pass through the others. The result of this effect is the passage of time from one moment to the next on all levels of scale, but each size on the scale at its own rate. Time passes more rapidly the smaller in physical scale one descends, and less so the larger. However, from one moment to the next, all things change over time. The past is the father and mother of the present, and the present is the father and mother of the future. Because the aura is the exterior of the soul, which the mind is the interior, and this shape is a torus or hypersphere, and because the shape of the cosmos itself forms a hypersphere whose interior sphere is any one soul, we can say the mind and soul are ubiquitous at their greatest extent with the cosmos as a map exactly overlapping its terrain, but that at all lesser levels than the entirety of space-time, this holographic hypersphere descends downward in scale causing entropic gravity to pull the matter energy of the cosmos through pinholes in the fabric of the continuum called black holes, which are simply the smallest and oldest form of matter energy particle wave. However, there is one size smaller than a black hole's singularity, and thus only this form of light can escape one. This is the tachyon, which is also shaped like a torus, because the tachyon and the soul are both torus-shaped, they and the cosmos itself form a holographic hypersphere, such that tachyons permeate the entire cosmos, causing entropic gravity, which in turn is experienced by the soul as emotions, thoughts, and ideas. Thus, what we see when we look at this rendition by Aleister Crowley of the usual circle of twelve zodiac signs is the cross-section of a torus, or, expressed more simply, one half of a torus seen from the side. Here we see that, just as the diagonal bisecting a 3D cube is the square root of 3, and the diagonal across a 2D square is the square root of 2, half of a 3D sphere will appear from the side as a 2D circle, while half of a 4D hypersphere is this shape, a flattened 4D torus seen from the side. If we follow the direction of the zodiac signs labeled by the Roman numerals around the circular orbit seen from the side as the cross-section of a torus, we will be tracing out a unilinear vector around the surface of the torus, which forms the edge dividing the two halves of a hypersphere into the 4D torus seen from the side. This shape shows us the form of the torus, the tachyon, the cosmos, the soul, the mind, and the multiverse. When we apply the form of the torus to understanding the level of the mind, we find it can extend across a total of ten potential dimensions, as such. 1. The 1D point. 2 the circular flat 2D plane, 3, the 3D sphere, 4, the 4D hypersphere, 5, the 5D torus of a hypersphere, 6, 
a hypersphere inside the cross section of the 5D torus of a 4D hypersphere over a 3D sphere above and below a 2D circle around and about a 1D origin point. 7. A sphere inside this second exterior hypersphere. 8. A circle of this second sphere. 9. An origin point inside this other circle. And 10. The point of view of someone observing this entire model from outside of it. In applying this 10D model of the mind to a torus form, we may label each size level on its multiple scales, and by doing so, may arrive at the following set of conclusions. The first dimension, the origin point. When we magnify the origin point of such a structure to its utmost, we find it expressing a holographic reflection of all the other levels within itself. This multilayered pluralism can best be symbolized as two intersecting 3D tetrahedrons, forming a 4D hypertetrahedron or stalactahedron. The stalactahedron represents the combination of polar opposites into one single form. In the case of the 10D model of the mind, we find these dual poles correspond to fact and fiction, otherwise called truth and lies. Although there are degrees combining lies or fiction with facts, there is only one truth, the whole truth comprised of all facts, and not diluted at all by lies or fiction. The exact opposite of this one truth, then, is thus the one greatest lie ever told, the ultimate fiction. One symbolizes God exterior to oneself, the other as interior. The second dimension, the flat circular plane. This is the reflecting pool of the layers above that has as its particulate water drops the quanta or information units symbolized by the stalactahedron. As the number of these quanta asymptotically approaches infinite via the conversion of matter into energy over time that results from particles gradually breaking apart from a mass and forming free radicals or randomly patterned energy loss as heat, the mind expands. Therefore, it is because thoughts are tachyons and because tachyons are smaller than black hole singularities and because black holes pull all matter energy and space-time toward them. Thus, as the space between black holes contracts, the space measured by the mind as tachyon thoughts expands. The third dimension, the round orb or sphere. Symbolic of the mind itself in this ten-dimensional model, this is the largest level of real consciousness. On the surface of the sphere, infinite thoughts appear as a tessellated pattern across its face, such that the closer the surface of the sphere is to the observer, the larger the tessellated shape will appear, and the further the distance of the surface of the sphere from the observer, the smaller the tessellated shapes will appear, with the single thought occupying the center of the sphere of the mind under observation, and with all other of infinite thoughts tapering out to self-terminating finitude around the outer edge. The fourth dimension, the hypersphere over time. The hypersphere in the ten-dimensional model of potential awareness symbolizes the mind over time. Animals and humans both exhibit the capacity for thought However, what differentiates self-aware humans from less self-aware animals is that humankind can focus on and derive inspiration from the knowledge of our own mortality and inevitable bodily death, while animals do not comprehend that their life will one day end. This results because the animal's attention span is short and it takes less time for it to become distracted by material reality while the human self-concept has, at its deepest core, the idea that one day the mind might cease to think, the body cease to be, and the ego's self cease to exist. 
It is fear of losing life that motivates our species, far beyond those of the rest of the animals, to cultivate cultural beliefs and to leave our physical mark on historical spans of time. This is the level of the survival instinct, said to be the prime motive for all living behavior. The fifth dimension, the tachyon torus of the mind over time. Because the tachyon is the smallest scale quantum or information unit of particle wave in the matter-energy-space-time continuum of our local universe, and because the mind serves as a large version of the same form, the torus, formed as an aggregate of tachyons like a hologram of a gnomon, rather like a hollow gnomon, the tachyon and the mind forms are interchangeable over time. Thus, the torus of the mind is a single holographic tachyon, and the torus of a single tachyon expands to become the torus of the mind not by growing larger, but by becoming more complex across its surface. So, too, is true of the singularity of our own local universe, which expands from the Big Bang outward toward a critical mass, at which point it begins consuming itself until at some point in this grand cycle roughly opposite our own current cosmos, the multiverse formed of antimatter and dark energy inverted from our own continuum's matter energy being pulled through the veil of space-time into the realm of time-space beyond, completely evaporates into a zero-energy, zero-time nulliverse, where nothingness non-exists eternally. The sixth dimension the hypersphere of another's mind, exterior to our own. As I have demonstrated in another lecture, on ESP, telepathy can work in one of three ways, or else not work at all. One is one-way telepathy from a source to a subject, as in direct and unaware mind control. Two, one-way telepathy from a subject to a source, as in indirect and aware mind reading, or three, in an equal, both-way psychic rapport, two equal minds can form a permanent bond and become soulmates. However, ESP or telepathy of these forms is only one kind of mind over matter, in those cases of one person's mind over the gray matter of another person's brain. However, one's mind can also be applied telekinetically over non-living matter as well. When this is practiced, one can learn to project gravity. However, mastering this practice is very hard because it is not a matter of mental strength, but of expanding in one's mind's eye a mental projection from the size of tachyons on which scale our minds and subspace matter share a common field or continuum and which allow us to influence quanta unconsciously all the time in the form of our free will. Into real energy wavelengths, the same frequency as the circumference of the object's particles. The seventh dimension. The five senses of two, combining as a sixth sense for both. One sphere of the mind reflects as the primary thought on its surface the sphere of the mind of another, like looking at your reflection in another person's eye, or like a two-way mirror, and this causes a feedback loop to occur between the two people's souls. When this happens, we shift our perceptual attention span out of focus while looking at somebody else's eyes such that they seem to shift and appear to combine between them as a third eye, the Ajna. This Ajna, because it is an optical illusion seen on someone else's face only because we are crossing our eyes while looking at them, exists in symbolic space between reality and the pure truth of the mind. This is the realm of fiction or lies that combines reality below with truth above in the form of interspersed facts in a novel narrative format. The Eighth Dimension 
one's own perception of the soul of another being. The conservation of angular momentum effect of point vector motion on a spherical surface that causes particles of matter to asymptotically break apart into free radical wavelengths of energy is slightly slowed when it experiences friction against counterspin of these particles in the form of conservation of dimension, such as the conservation on a spherical surface to movement only in three dimensions the six sum coordinate pairs of equatorial latitudinal, polar longitudinal, and rotational orbital. The combination of angular momentum by dimension and of dimension by angular momentum results in solid particles of all various size scales rotating at all the different frequencies of wavelengths measurable within the cosmos over all time. In short, that which we perceive to exist appears to do so as objects of various volume in different locations in space that can change over time in shape and location, when in truth all we are truly sensing is a flattened reflection of the world outside of it on the inside surface of our womb-like aura. We are brains in jars, in essence. The Ninth Dimension Self-awareness in one is the spirit in another. The self-awareness in itself of each of us is the same in every other one of us as well. It is how we experience this self-awareness that differs. We are just leaves on the tree of life, while the mind of God moves through us invisibly like the wind. Lines of thought, single-point ideas, and wave fields of emotion comprise the edges, corners, and sides of the massive metaforms or hypershapes in four dimensions which pass through us invisibly in the form of changes over time, both entropic and negantropic, both fractal and gnomon, both inanimate and living. Thus, when one mind reads another, which is also reading it, and an infinitely repeating impossible feedback loop of mental energy is formed between two separate people, as in an epiche or epitome on the existence of nothingness, then it is considered the mind of the cosmos reading itself, God conversing with himself through us, and thus both minds dissolve into one circuit, and this forms a hologram reflecting the macrocosmic metaphor, mind of God. The ego dissolves into oneness with the primary clear light. The tenth dimension, not depicted, expressed as the observer seeing this model. In the order of the division of the elementary forces from one another at one Planck time, following the Big Bang, superheated metastasis expansion of the singularity at the original moment of coming into being of our current cosmos, gravity formed first, followed by electromagnetism, followed by weak nuclear fission, followed lastly by strong nuclear fusion. This mirrors the descent from a pure dimensional zero time, zero energy nulliverse toward the singularity of the Big Bang. First in the nulliverse was the pure dimension of time. From this fell down one size scale, a measure of depth or volume. Following at a right angle from this formed an extension of height or area. From this extension to connect with volume next emitted at a right angle from both, the 180 degree opposite directions co-measuring the dimensional singularity point as a distance over duration of motion in space-time called length or origin. 
Thus time equals gravity. Electromagnetism equals volume. Fission equals area. And fusion equals origin. These are then called in shorthand by their terrestrial elemental counterparts, respectively water, air, fire, and earth. These are equivalent to the four worlds of Kabbalah, accessible as mind states. This describes the physics of the world beyond the 10D model in which you, the viewer, exists, thinks, and lives. So we see how a toroid, hypersphere, or sphere within a sphere, the same is used as the basis of the 10D model of consciousness, with only four levels, also expresses the same form of levels as we saw occurring for the mind, occurring here to reflect levels of the material physical cosmos. Outside of time-space is the one eternal spirit, which permeates throughout all levels to reform in the core world as a single soul within each quantum being. Surrounding this core is each being's unique and singular physically biological body. Outside of and around this, surrounding it in the realm beyond, are the many bodies of other beings, comprised of other forms of quanta, as well as those alike those of our own ego's self-definition. Within each of these is also a soul, and thus so there are as many souls as there have ever been, are now, or ever will be, quantum beings capable of embodying them, or rather, immortal energy fields which can exist until the end of the multiverse's evaporation into the nulliverse. These are adjacent at their outermost side, facing away from one's own central core, single soul, to the origin of our own single soul, that being the eternal, single spirit beyond all time-space. This model also represents the four worlds of Kabbalah. These are now, in descending order from the outermost and closest to the Godhead, at Saluth, equivalent to the realm of time and of the mind over time. Yet Syra, equivalent to the realm of depth in space and to the conscious mind. Bariah, equivalent to the realm of width in space and thoughts on the mind. And finally, the core realm of Asaya, that is equivalent to the length of a point in space and an idea in the mind. Here we see the four worlds of Kabbalah expressed as ascending outward from our own single soul in the innermost core realm of Isaiah toward beyond the bright limitless nothingness in the realm of Atsaluth. We see thus how the four worlds of Kabbalah relate to the formation of the four elemental forces which we see as originating in the furthest reaches from our own point of view as gravity, water, followed by electromagnetism, air, followed by fission, fire, followed by fusion, earth. However, as I said, this is the relationship of these elements to one another from the point of view of the observer at the core of their own single soul, within their body, looking out through their eyes, etc. But if we look at the same relationship of elements, from the point of view of an observer whose orientation is from the origin of the mental emanations that coagulated into the material elements, the same array appears reversed. Here we see that the Big Bang signifies God, gravity, absolute, electromagnetism, Yetzira, fission, Baraya, and fusion, Aziah wherein we live on the exterior most of this core sample, on the uppermost arc labeled critical mass of the space-time continuum. Further Theories Part 2b Quantum Astrophysics Part 2b1 The Light Cone of Time 
to depict the mathematical concept of a sum over histories for the motions made by all particles and waves since the original formation of the cosmos in the Big Bang. We picture the singularity of the local universe as a sphere which does not and will not expand, but which merely grows more complex on its surface. We see above a light cone is simply a core sample from the upper crust of our universe where we dwell within the thin film of the space-time continuum toward the core of the figurative sphere of the universal singularity which we call the Big Bang event. The Big Bang core of our spherical space-time continuum signifies the beginning of time where time is measured by the speed of light in a void called C used to measure space-time in light years. Around a depth inside our universal core of 18 billion years ago, the Big Bang began the expansion or complexification on the surface of our current cosmic continuum. The modern graph of the light cone sum over histories of our present universe, the continuum we dwell in below the speed of photons in a vacuum, that is the surface of space-time, shows also the alteration to the light cone core sample and its expansion rate over time caused by the differentiation from pure thermal radiation of the four elemental forces around one Planck time following the Big Bang. As mentioned in a prior section of these lectures, the proper order for their division is following the Big Bang gravity, electromagnetism, fission, and fusion, followed by the counting of the first Planck time of our cosmic existence. In this depiction, we show the universal expansion rate as a combination of all three possible forms for its geometry. One, flat, meaning perpetual expansion. Two, round, meaning perpetual stationary space, or three, hyperbolic or saddle-shaped, meaning an open geometry that results in repeating cycles of big bangs, expansions, contractions, and implosions. On the far right we see the big bang. The light cone sweeps downward in a conical arc shaped like a horn or a cornucopia. The first division signifies the first formation of gravity, followed by electromagnetism, followed by fission, followed by fusion. The last division occurred either at one Planck time after the creation or sometime since the division of the elements, and is signified as critical mass, the point at which the expanding universe reaches maximum stasis point and begins metastasizing the complexity on its surface. In the upper left we see a cross-section of our current universe symbolized by a sphere inside a sphere, or a hypersphere, with twin toroids on either side between the inner and outer sphere. The inner sphere is our present universal space-time continuum below the speed of light. The twin toroids on the left and right of it signify black hole pairs emitting from a central wormhole are contained above the speed of photons but below the limit of time space, which is defined as the exterior of the multiverse formed of all n possible multiple world lines diverging as parallel dimensions. Quantum Astrophysics Part 2b2 2 2. Cosmology The Big Bang to the Present let us begin with the Tau sub Dao Tesseract of Time. It is called Dao sub Dao because when one extends a number line outward from the Big Bang and counts off increasingly more infinite number sets, the most infinite set of numbers one can count to is comprised of the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet repeated twice, once as a numeral and once as a participle subtended to the final sum to denote it as having been multiplied by itself as well as to create a squared representation of it 
which takes shape in the form of the tesseract of all tachyons over time, the measuring device superseding in a perfect but unachievably ideal form the entire cosmic cycle from our current multiverse to the nulliverse and back through another Big Bang. Genesis says the cosmos was created in seven days. Here we see the six scale levels of astrophysics we will be discussing, and the lowest level, our own planetary system, will be discussed in more detail in a subsequent lecture. For now, let us view these, and then return to each to go over them all more thoroughly. Thus, we begin with the Tau sub Tau Tesseract structure encompassing eternity, and we next start to descend inward toward the center of its core. As mentioned, the title of the Tau sub Tau Tesseract derives from a form of counting transfinite sums on a number line. This can be done by examining varying types of number sets. Natural numbers begin with one and count up. Counting numbers count up also, but include zero. Integers count up and down from zero, including negative and positive, whole and fractional numbers. Irrationals include imaginary, transcendental, and certain square root numbers. However, all these number sets have one-to-one -one correspondence, meaning each counts an equally infinite sum of possible numbers, and that none counts more sums than any of the others. If you superimposed all these sets onto one another, they would form a single cohesive whole exactly equal to each of its individual parts. In short, you cannot add them to one another to increase the infinite number sum of these sets count two by adding or multiplying one by another. Thus, these four number sets, the naturals, counting, integers, and irrationals, combined are called the infinite set of all rational numbers. Thus, the set of all rational number sums is denumerable with an infinite sum set. We can call this fifth number sum set of all rational numbers the sum of all the other sets combined, a fifth dimension, hyperspace, made of a fifth element, tachyons, above the other four dimensions of space-time and elementary forces in our own cosmos. The four forces of space-time, plus the fifth element of faster-than-photon metaforms from beyond, but that pass invisibly through, our cosmos, comprise the form of the multiverse of parallel dimensional baby universes formed outside the vacuum speed of photons by black holes inverting matter energy within our own cosmos into dark energy and antimatter without. The maximum amount of matter our cosmos can contain, called critical mass, occurred following the division, at one Planck time following the Big Bang, of the four elements. During the earliest stellar phases, when the first black holes began to form. Following critical mass, the universe was divided between the cosmic continuum of matter-energy within space-time and the multiverse of tachyonic parallel dimensions beyond time-space. Our present universe is defined as follows. Space extends in time outward from Earth around 16 billion light years in all directions. Below the speed of light, we see our own local universe defined as a complex pattern within an expansion of the original singularity, a network of galaxies aligning along filaments between vast voids of empty space. However, beyond the speed of photons, this appearance is revealed as merely an illusion, such that, in the last 16 billion years, all the furthest galaxies from us would have already been consumed into their core black holes. Thus, we find that our own local universe is simultaneously expanding, the voids, and contracting, burning out stars into massive black holes, and that as this occurs, more matter is converted into energy than vice versa, 
which will eventually result in a total evaporation of our present cosmos into a conceptual cosmos of pure tachyonic energy called a nulliverse. When the last star in our cosmos has been swallowed up through a final supermassive black hole, the multiverse of baby universes surrounding us now will metastasize into a pure 1D singularity, and the cycle will repeat the original Big Bang event. Quantum Astrophysics Part 2B3 Black Holes and Wormholes we can look at our present universe as an expansion of entropy outward from a core p instanton sized 1d singularity measured along an axis of infinite time we would exist on a small dot on the surface of this model and would be able to observe various effects occurring from our present vantage point some of which would affect the space below the speed of light and some of which would project beyond now into the future of cosmic time. Both would be equally observable, despite the present moment being the surface of the space-time continuum upon which we exist. We would simply have to be able to predict effects based on a view including a dimension greater than light years of space-time measured by photons moving at the speed of light. Our own position on this surface is furthest from wormholes within the voids between intergalactic filaments, closer to the gravity wells of the intragalactic black holes that link by one pole the core singularity of our own local universe, and by the other pole the core singularity of a unique baby universe that bubbles off faster than photons into the future. Our own point of view from here on planet Earth is closest within this cosmic model to a moment of alignment between our own spiral galaxy, the Milky Way, with our nearest neighboring galaxy, Andromeda. As their black hole core's poles approach overlapping alignment, so too does our own Sun align with the Milky Way's core, as do our planets sometimes all align. When two galaxies' core black holes' poles align, such as our own Milky Way is currently moving toward relative to Andromeda, there is an alignment between them along a shared axis of tachyonic energy released by the black hole's poles. This effect forms a wormhole between the two galactic core's black holes. When this happens, a large amount of gravity moves between the two galaxies, causing a warping of the photon surface of visible space-time. When this occurs, photons will become invisible, and the illusion they transmit, which we currently see as real, will disappear to reveal the true depth of time beyond our present perception of space. In the event of such an intergalactic gravitic alignment, such as that soon to occur between the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies, a wormhole forms in the deep space void between the galaxies. This occurs due to the alignment of the poles of the black hole core of one galaxy with those of another. The poles of intragalactic core black holes eject tachyons in the form of jet stream clouds of iron gas moving faster than photons. As these tachyons travel outward from the galactic core black hole's poles, they are gradually pulled downward in a vast toroidal arc toward the poles of the stars in the galaxy around the core black hole. All of this occurs, usually, invisibly, since the energy of gravity is traveling faster than visible light. However, the result is the variances in precession of the electromagnetic poles of all stars, planets, and non-tidally locked moons. At the moment when the core black hole poles of two nearby spiral galaxies align, a wormhole forms in the deep space void between them, and this acts as a form of lens through which to view the universal depth of the past 
and to perceive the multiverse of baby universes that exist beyond now within the future. During this event, that is, through this temporal wormhole, you will be able to see the entire cycle of the past as it revolves around to connect to the far end of the future, and vice versa, because the singularity before our own local universe expanded is the same as the singularity inside each offspring universal timeline past the multiverse. Thus, all the galactic core black holes poles are interconnected along filaments, by occasional alignments that transmit a gravitic pulse along the single-dimensional superstring formed of all filaments. This is, in fact, occurring all the time. However, the effect is invisible to the naked eye because we perceive only electromagnetic radiation on the spectrum field below the velocity of photons in a total vacuum. Because there is no absolute emptiness in all space, photons encounter resistance against slower matter energies quanta, and the result of this friction is entropy, which we experience as age, change, and the passage of time. The warping of light by gravity causes the appearance to our eyes of the cosmos as we believe it exists around us now. However, the further we travel away from a gravity well, the less impeded by space time becomes, and the faster light can travel. Thus, light warped from a galactic core black hole can either bend around toward the galaxy's star's poles, or it can accelerate beyond the speed of time experienced near stars to pass between galaxies instantly. Thus, the entire lifeline time span across which can be measured the existence of any given galaxy is equal, below the speed of light, to, above it, a parallel baby universe of dark energy and antimatter. When we look at light traveling along this wormhole's pathway, between the aligned poles of two or more galactic core black holes, we can perceive the combination of each galaxy with its reverse temporal counterpart to comprise a baby universe within a singularity inside each galaxy's core black hole. However, the lens of the singularity dividing a galaxy in space-time from its paired antiparticle partner in time-space is the same for our own local universe as for each of the smaller, baby universes that our local universe bubbles off into the future. In other words, the singularity of the present is now adjacent to both the continuum of the past below and the future above. The concept of a wormhole is that a particle entering one side of it will exit out the other in less time than it would take for a particle traveling at the same speed to reach the same distant point by traveling along the path of least resistance in a perfectly straight line. A wormhole is conceptualized as a tunnel through hyperspace that bypasses subspace, that is, a path of zero time resistance with no entropic breakdown that supersedes our standard reality. A photon can enter one end of a wormhole and come out the other end simultaneously and likewise an electron can quantum tunnel from one end of such a tube to the other in zero time. In the standard model, such as depicted in this Feynman diagram for a photon, it exists along a wavelength of time between one event moment in space-time and another, because at the starting end it formed from a pairing of a positron and an electron, and at the opposite end, it parted their pairing and sent flying off in new directions one positron and one electron. Since there is no such thing as deep space entirely devoid and empty of all energy, positrons and electrons are perpetually colliding to form photons, and photons are perpetually colliding with one another to break these subquantum pair bonds apart. However, in the proper elemental conditions to perceive distant spaces along the axis of a wormhole through zero time, we can see that the photons comprising the fabric of the electromagnetic effect 
can themselves be sped up past their maximum velocity in an absolute vacuum, and that thus solid matter can travel faster than time. Wormholes can cross intergalactic filament distances by moving matter energy through the voids between them instantly. Just as positrons and electrons pair and part as photons, and photons pair and part as electromagnetic spectral matter energy, so at their fastest speed these pairing and parting collisions freeze and do not change at all, existing eternally, invisible, in zero time. In the same way that on the surface of our cosmos, the present space-time continuum, if measured along an axis of time, we find wormholes into the past and future, connecting the 1D singularity at the core of our own local universe to the same singularity reflected in the core of each baby universe, which form over time out of matter-antimatter bubbles combining parallel dimensional galaxies, reflected within any spiral galaxy's core black hole. So we can, if measuring shapes forming in space rather than patterns over durations of time, see that the surface of our present continuum is a flat plane with the Big Bang at its furthest event horizon, that closer to us from then are galaxies, which contain within their core black holes on the surface of which are wormholes that connect to the interior baby universes inside the core black hole. The four elemental and four-dimensional force-carrying quanta, including tachyons as the particle carrying the force of gravity, combine to comprise a fifth form in the series that is equal to each individually as well as to all of them combined into one. The 1D singularity the 2D galaxy, the 3D black hole, the 4D wormhole, and the 5D baby universe parallel the sets, respectively, of rationals, integers, counting, natural, and irrational numbers. And just as we have learned that the four number sum sets below the rationals all have one-to-one -one correspondence to one another within the infinite set of all rational numbers, so too can we model each trait by scale upon the surface of a single model that combines all of them overlapping into one without changing the function or form of any of the smaller parts. We see here the fabric of the space-time continuum as a grid of purple on black emanating from the yellow Big Bang in the upper right corner of the chart with twin spiral galaxies, one clockwise, the other counterclockwise, depicted in yellow, whose core black holes are enlarged and shown as a blue torus around a black sphere with a yellow pole emitting red gas jets to arc into blue toroids surrounding the yellow galaxies. Emitting from these poles below the surface of the fabric of space-time in a green spiral history is a small baby universe reflecting the inverse of its parent galaxy. Between the two galaxies below the surface of space-time is a yellow and purple time tunnel or wormhole. Quantum Astrophysics Part 2 B 4 Entropy via the space-time continuum. Now that we have examined the various different features of our space-time continuum that exceed into the future or supersede into the past, let us more closely examine the nature of our own present event in the local universe. To do this, we will be looking at the process of matter-energy exchange for a single quanta of space as it changes over time. From the point at which the continuum's photon surface forms from a positron-electron pair bond until the point at which it has recycled through its entire possible history of phase changes and once again reforms into a photon from a positron-electron pair bond, we will be looking at 18 stages. 
In order to familiarize ourselves with this model for the surface of our space-time continuum, we begin by depicting space as a black line above and time as a blue line below, while we measure the activity of the present moment as a series of phase changes to a single quanta of space over time in red. Later, we will also add solid matter in green to the red field of energy between black space and blue time. 1. We begin by seeing the surface of the space-time continuum as we might imagine it to occur usually as a basis. As such, we see time below, closer to the past, and space above, closer to the future, with regular, straight, and directionally alternating red field lines of pure tachyonic energy between them. This composition constitutes the moment of universal critical mass following the division of the four forces one Planck time after the Big Bang. 2. Time begins to bow upward toward space and assumes a bell curve wavelength because space exerts gravity Gravity warps the motion of photons, and photons measure the surface of space-time over light years. We see the usual beginnings of thermodynamic heat and cooling occurring as convex and concave currents. These signify the original motions in space over time of the particles of the four forces. 3. The so-called standard arrow of entropy determining the measurement of time as change in a forward motion of space begins to arise as a result of extreme gravitational warping to time by the particles of the four forces of space, dividing the convex currents outside in the future from the concave currents inside the past. 4. This results in the formation of tachyons as the first form of energy prior to the existence of any form of solid matter, precursor to the formation of the four force elemental particles. Tachyons form a pair bonding combination of entropic time with the currents of temporal energy to form temporary solid matter from pure time. 5. Our own local universe's history begins when matter forms, seemingly from a form of more eternal energy that exists prior to the creation of our own space-time in the form of a temporal singularity. Inside this temporal singularity, space-time, our own universal reality, will begin to expand and to grow ever more complex on its surface. 6. The measure of space over time in the form of photon light years begins with the event of space time breaking off from time, between time and space. Inside this event is where space time will begin to grow, and outside it remain the faster than photon energy of tachyons. 7. At the first moment of time, there is a random quantum fluctuation that occurs as the time inside the event that broke off from the timeline surface of time-space to move toward the surface of space-time breaks through the surface of space to form the effect of gravity, the inversion of tachyon energy into hyperspace antimatter. 8. From this random quantum fluctuation, or Big Bang event, when time's pure energy transforms through space into solid matter, which is then transformed back into energy over time, the original creation of matter with mass occurs. This is the formation of the space-time singularity of a local, or baby universe, from the greater continuum of a time-space multiverse. 9. The effect of matter with mass forming above the surface of space is, on the surface of space, identical to the effect of space on time, that being gravity, or rather, 
a similar form of attractive rather than repulsive force. In the case of tachyons between time and space, they flow one way, while in the case of matter from within space over time, the motion of their flow's effect is another, specifically such that they are at right angles to one another, resulting in subquantum friction. 10. As matter affects a gravitic force warping the surface of space, it causes the energy of tachyons between space and time to froth into what is called zero-point energy, or quantum foam, smaller than the smallest known solid matter quanta, on a sub-quantum scale, smaller than a micron, both faster and slower than light. This causes time to assume a regular waveform pattern, such as its passage in cycles as we experience it today. 11. Matter, from its own point of view, seems thus to emit gravity waves that attract rather than repel other solid matter. The usual forms of less solid energy waves that permeate all space between objects of matter are all repulsive, but gravity constricts the angular momentum of otherwise asymptotically free particles to pull them into automatically self-limiting circular colonies of like particles. 12. At this point, we reach our own present place in this measurement of the history of all eternal time. When matter has penetrated gravitationally through the surface of space-time, into the tachyonic energy of time-space, past critical mass, and begun to form a surrounding layer, a multiverse bubble of baby universes, spiral galaxies of stars form around black holes that puncture through space-time into time-space. 13. The exact measurement of critical mass as the ratio of time between the present and the Big Bang is also related to the duration between the Big Bang and critical mass. This 1 to 2 over 3rd ratio can be expressed as the mass of any object of matter multiplied by the speed of photons in a vacuum squared, summing to the amount of energy equivalent to that mass of matter over time. The local universe of matter, thus, plus the entire multiverse of tachyon energy beyond and within it, combine to form the rate of space-time, the speed of photons in a vacuum, as a light year. 14. By the gravitic bending of space-time by the influence of the mass of matter, which occurs in the form of distorting, bending, warping, etc., the vectors of photons, altering them from the exactly straight ray of light in a total vacuum. A similar trans-temporal and hyperspatial warping occurs above the speed of light within time-space outside the local universe of matter-energy. 15. When we measure time as partially distorted by and space as totally relative to, the concept of matter-energy defining the limit of our space-time continuum we observe then the optical illusion that our local universe is expanding over time, when in truth it is the same size as the original singularity event of random quantum fluctuation called the Big Bang. It has just simply grown more complex upon its surface. 16. What we see here, thus, is actually occurring in the exact same 1D singularity in time as all the others, even though here we are observing details at a different depth of the cross-section of space. Although the local universe of matter-energy, our own space-time continuum, appears to expand, it is only due to more distortion occurring to the measurement of time. A light year can't be a constant with a variable speed of light. 17. As we see, the local universe of matter, the seemingly expanding globe of green between the blue bubbling surface of time 
and the wavelength of averaged space is not truly expanding, only becoming more complex as a reflection on its surface of the distortion to the constant timeline base unit. As the tachyon energy around the outside of the local matter energy universe approaches asymptotic particle liberation velocity of excitation, the local universe appears to expand, but is really only reflecting a more complex form of pattern occurring beyond light speed outside of matter energy between space and time. 18. At this point, our own local universe appears as it does to us in the present, with a layer of space inside a layer of time. Space is moving one direction, and time is moving the opposite direction, and there is a dynamic stasis of equally opposite directional total vacuum velocity tachyons between them. Such comprises the surface of the nulliverse that surrounds the multiverse that surrounds our local universe, that surrounds our galaxy, that surrounds a black hole, that is surrounded by wormholes, and which, in turn, surrounds a baby universe as a reflection of the galaxy. When we take a cross-section of a graph plotted according to the conditions of space as a flat surface operating in the opposite direction of a flat timeline, the result is what I call a rolling boil graph, because as the water of tachyon energy between the surface of space and the timeline vessel boils, and a mass of matter is added into the boiling water of gravitic tachyons, the result is the apparent expansion of the material reality when in truth it is only reflecting a more complex distortion to the continuum surrounding it. Quantum Astrophysics Part 2b5 Cosmology Our Current Universe To reiterate what was said also before, there are six layers of study of this diagram. Between the realm of a planet orbiting a star and the realm of the Tau sub Tau tesseract, measuring motion of a 3D shape, energy over matter squared, over time as a metaform, all matter energy at the speed of light squared. The outermost layer we have touched on was Tau sub Tau, which should be familiar also to those of us who have studied Kabbalah as the realm beyond the outermost emanation of the ten sephirot, defined as Atzaluth of Ein Light, Ein Sof, Clear Light, and Ein Sof Or, the primary clear light. As we descend inward toward our own place upon earth in the here and now, from the outermost measure of all time as eternity, we approach closer to our own cosmos having formed from the Big Bang and the division of four forces, past critical mass into the form of the modern local universe of matter energy surrounded by a multiverse of tachyons. We descend past the measure of space over time toward the moment of the event of alignment between the Andromeda and our own Milky Way galaxies toward the fourth arm out from the core of the Milky Way, where our planet Earth orbits our star, the Sun, and then we retreat back to the outermost levels of time beyond material reality in Tao sub Tao. We now know the black Tao sub Tao tesseract to embody the cubed square of time, surrounding the green Aleph sub omega hypersphere of space seen down the red wormhole center of time along the Aleph sub sigma orbs core toward the blue Aleph sub n torus shaped cycle of cosmic time where our present multiverse in black on the left exchanges places with the nulliverse of pure tachyon energy on the right, via the perpetual engine of creation in green in the center, causing an ever-expanding and simultaneously contracting singularity to grow more complex a reflection on its surface. Such is the nature of all matter 
with mass in space over the entire eternity of all time. Yet we can also graph the same six levels of dimensional directions along an expanding space chart instead of within the layered levels of size scales plotting expansion over time. This is what the physical material universe can look like when we extend the directional dimension of space rather than time, where by scale of relative size we have subquantum baby universes within supermassive black holes bubbling away our local universe of voids and filaments of galaxies surrounding our own Milky Way inside which are our star, moon, and our own planet, Earth. Religious Metaphysics A lecture by Jonathan Barlow Gee